still are online. I'm calling the matter of Blind SA and Minister of Trade, Industry and Competition and others for hearing. Council are now invited to place themselves on record. Please note that this hearing is being recorded. Yes, Council. Uh, thank you, Justice Madlanga and Justices of the Court. Uh, my name is Jonathan Berger. I appear for the applicant together with Dr. Veriava and Mr. Musa, instructed by Section 27. Thank you, Mr. Berger. Justice Madlanga and Justice of the Court, um, I appear on behalf of the respondent in this matter together with my learned junior, Ms. Talk. Thank you, Ms. Raja Patlanda. Thank you, Justice Madlanga, Justices of the Court. My name is Isabel Goodman. I appear for the first amicus curiae, Professor Dean, together with Mr. Lindy. Thank you, Ms. Goodman. Justice Madlanga, Justices of the Court. My name is Michael Power, and I appear on behalf of the second amicus curiae, the Media Monitoring Africa Trust. Thank you, Mr. Power. Justice Madlanga, Justice of the Constitutional Court. My name is Mohammed Zakaria Suleiman. I appear for the third amicus together with Malani Jr., Mr. Tandive Mdleche. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Suleiman. Yes, uh, Mr. Berger. May, may I just quickly say this to counsel? <clears throat> in the interest of time, counsel, but that is all counsel, I'm addressing all counsel. In the interest of time, Please be assured that uh, we've gone through your written submissions thoroughly. So uh, just focus on whatever you consider to, to be the most important or, or salient uh, issues you would want to, to, to highlight or, or focus our minds on, but not to rehash what you have said in your written submissions. That will also help you to be able to finish your, your submissions within the allocated time. Thank you. Thanks to all counsel. Yes, Mr. Bergen. Thank you, Justice Madlanga. One passes through the most beautiful nine meter high timber doors to enter the foyer to this court. Carved into the wood are sign language symbols and words depicting all the rights enshrined in the constitution. On either side of the door handle is a plaque which notes in all official languages when the court building was officially opened and by whom. The door handle itself in solid brass is inscribed with braille. It appears to be the only braille in the building. One can reach the entrance to the foyer by walking up the great African steps, passing the court building on one's left and number four where black prisoners were housed on one's right. Snaking up between the steps is a paved ramp with the promise of access for those with physical disabilities being rudely interrupted from time to time by the occasional step. Across from the entrance to the foyer, on the ground in front of the stairwells of the old awaiting trial block, is the text of the preamble to the Constitution. Amongst other things, it states that the Constitution was adopted as the supreme law of the Republic, so as to improve the quality of life of all citizens and free the potential of each person. We are here today because that promise continues to be broken day after day after day by the failure of the Copyright Act to ensure that persons with visual and print disabilities are able to access works under copyright. They require access to what are termed accessible format copies, such as braille, audio versions, copies of published works in large print and digital formats that enable the use of screen readers. But the vast majority of books are published in print with the World Intellectual Property Organization estimating that only one to 7% of books are published in a format that the 285 million persons with visual and print disabilities worldwide can read. And yet the Copyright Act effectively prevents accessible format copies of published works from being made locally or being imported from where they are lawfully made. It does this by making copyright infringement not only actionable at the instance of the copyright holder, but also a criminal offense. We're also here today because almost nine years after the international community agreed on the legal mechanisms to facilitate access for persons with visual and print disabilities, the state has yet to amend the Copyright Act in the manner contemplated by that agreement. To be fair, the state has made clear its intention to legislate in this way, 
with Parliament already having passed the Copyright Amendment Bill three years ago. Amongst other things, that bill provides, provided for the making and sharing of accessible format copies of works under copyright and for their import and export. Through the introduction to the Act of a new Section 19D, it sought to give domestic effect to the Marrakesh Treaty to facilitate access to published works for persons who are blind, visually impaired, or otherwise print disabled. But on the 16th of June, 2020, more than a year after it had completed its passage through Parliament, the bill was referred back to the National Assembly in terms of Section 79.1 of the Constitution. Since then, the decision to pass the bill has been rescinded and it has been re-tagged as a Section 76 bill. Now, almost two years since the President's referral, five years since the bill was first tabled in Parliament, and almost seven years since a draft bill was published for public comment, the bill is yet to make its way out of committee. Nobody knows when it will be ready for reconsideration by the National Assembly before it is then sent to the NCOP, the National Council of Provinces, to begin its processes afresh in accordance with Section 76. And that process could take considerable time. The result of this is that Section 19D is effectively held hostage pending the outcome of an ongoing legislative process focused on other issues. For Blind SA, which seeks to put an end to the book famine, that is just unacceptable. That, it is why, that is why it turns to the High Court to ensure that people with visual and print disabilities are able to access works under copyright without having to wait the enactment and subsequent com coming into force of the full set of amendments to the Act in whatever form they may ultimately take. In this court, we seek an order in three parts. First, an order declaring that the Copyright Act is inconsistent with the Constitution to the extent identified. Second, the immediate reading in of Section 19D in the form in which it was originally enacted, originally passed by Parliament. <laughs> and third, an order directing the first respondent to pay blind essays costs, including the costs of two counsel, both in this court and in the High Court. In, in certain respects, this case is somewhat unique. First, everyone in this matter, whether a party or amicus curiae, accepts that the legislative framework as a whole unfairly discriminates against persons with visual and print disabilities and unreasonably and unjustifiably limits a wide range of other constitutional rights. Everyone accepts that the legislative framework should be amended to give full domestic effect to the Marrakesh Treaty. Second, none of the respondents takes issue with any aspect of Blind SA's proposed reading in with the immediate effect of Section 19D of the bill. This includes the Speaker of the National Assembly and the Chairperson of the NCOP, the two persons who preside over the legislative process, and the President himself who referred the bill back to Parliament. So who disagrees with whom and on what issues? Insofar as the contemplated declarity is concerned, there's a small disagreement between Blind SA and the Minister relating to its possible suspension. We submit, however, that nothing of significance turns on this minor disagreement. On the papers, there's also disagreement with the Minister on costs in this court. We submit, in line with Levenstein and Rahube, both decisions of this court, that there is no reason why Blind SA, if successful, should not be awarded its costs in these confirmation proceedings. That leaves the two main issues raised by the first amicus, the source of the rights violations, and secondly, should the source be the act itself, as we submit is the case, what ought to be read into the act to cure its unconstitutionality. Everyone other than the first amicus, including the president, is comfortable with the proposed reading in of section 19D. We submit that in the context of this case, where parliament is already working on the text of that provision, reading in any other text, would be an impermissible interference with that process in breach of the doctrine of the separation of powers. We submit that section 19D in its current form would be both effective and operable without the need for anything more. But if this court were to find that section 19D is insufficient on its own to cure the identified unconstitutionality, it would be entitled to amend and or supplement the text to be read in to whatever extent is necessary. Regarding the source of the rights violations, 
we submit that the legal gymnastics required by the approach adopted by the first amicus shows just why it cannot be seriously entertained. But even if the contemplated regulations are permissible, their promulgation would still constitute an affront to the dignity of persons with visual and print disabilities who would have to leave the realization of their rights to the whims of the minister who may or may not decide to act. As important as the issues raised by the first minister and the first amicus may be, they should not serve to distract from the substantive issue before this court. The failure of our policy and lawmakers to domesticate an international agreement that identifies copyright barriers to access and how those barriers may be overcome to ensure that persons with visual and print disabilities are able to access works under copyright that the rest of us are easily able to access. The impact of the Copyright Act on the lives and rights of persons with visual and print disabilities is eloquently explained in four affidavits. The founding affidavit of Blind SA CEO, Mr. J. Snyer, and the supporting affidavits of retired Justice Zach Yakub, Mr. Marcus Lowe, and Mr. Eric Garmer. No one can read those affidavits and not be moved by how a seemingly innocuous stat statute has made and continues to make life so miserable for an already marginalized community. In short, persons with visual and print disabilities have waited far too long for their promised rights to be realized. On this, all the respondents agree. With this in mind, we submit that this court ought to put an end to that wait once and for all. Justice Madlanga, I had now intended to address a number of issues in, in my heads of argument, um, which given the time allocations um, and, and, and what we understand to be what the court appears to have identified as some of the issues it, it seeks guidance on or assistance with, um, perhaps I should, should ask for some guidance from you as to, as to what issues you think would be best for me to pursue. I, I had intended to, to look at how the act impedes access to works under copyright, how it limits the rights to equality, dignity, and education, why the limitation of the rights cannot be justified, and then go on to appropriate relief and the issue of costs. But I'm not sure if, if, if it would be appropriate to continue with that. It's exactly the end of your 10 minutes. So perhaps let us just uh, allow colleagues to put questions to you, Mr. Berger, and then after that engagement, you will decide what you still want to address. Colleagues. Thank you, thank you Mr. Berger. Colleagues. If I may, Justice Matlanga. Um, Mr. Berger, does Blind Essay contend that conversion into an accessible, accessible format constitutes an adaptation? And is this so because the process constitutes translation? Justice Tehran, the, the position of Blind SA is that in some circumstances, um, taking a work, for example, in, in print format and converting it into Braille, that may simply be a reproduction um, if nothing more is done. But there will be op opportunities where, or examples where if one takes a particular work to get it into a, a different format would, would require adaptation. So for example, if there is a, a graphic or a photograph in a book um, that needs some form of explanation in, in, the, way, in the form of text, then that, that would involve some kind of creativity on, on the part of the person who is preparing the accessible format copy. And there would need to be some kind of, effectively a translation of the picture into words. Um, so so I, th I think in short, the, the answer is, it depends on the particular, on what the work under copyright is. Um, and what process is involved to, to get it into an accessible format copy. If, if to one use, is taking- To use your, sorry, to use your example of the picture, wouldn't it, what would be happening in the process is that it, the picture would be converted into a format that would be understood by a person reading Braille. My, my understanding of Braille is, is, that, is that the Braille itself 
is in the form of letters. So each six, each Braille character corresponds to a, a letter of the of the of the alphabet. And so the only the only way to if we use the word to translate a picture into Braille would be to provide an explanation of the picture. Or if, if it's a, if it's a table in a in a in a report or a um, a graph in a scientific um, document. There would but have you to would be, be words you'd be described. conveying you'd be conveying the contents of the table. You'd be conveying yes. the, the 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 graphics in the picture. Now, sure. as I understand it, Braille is not a language. Is that right? I, I think that is correct. I, so, I, I, I'll, I'll, get, I'll take an but, instruction. But, but it's it's now. it's. Is it a means of enabling visually impaired people to read materials? L let me see if I can try and clarify the point. Translation means conversion from one language into another language. Correct. So if we're taking an English document and converting it into Braille, you take an Afrikaans document and convert, convert that to Braille, it would still be English, it would still be Afrikaans, would it not? That has been converted into Braille. Correct. Correct. I, I think, sorry, I, I don't yes, No, please proceed. I think that is correct, but, but Justice Tehran, if you look at the definition of, of adaptation in the Copyright Act, um, and let's say, for example, we are talking about a literary work, it says adaptation in relation to a literary work includes, and then it gives a number of, of examples. One of those examples is a translation of the work. So our submission here would be that the, the list of examples of what constitutes adaptation in the context of a literary work, um, it's not a closed list. Um, so one doesn't have to narrowly um, fit something into, into into the definition in A3 of translation to, to make the point that converting a, a document from one format into another, which requires the addition of new words, one doesn't have to say that it's a translation. If, it, if the final form is, is different in a way which is comparable to the translation process, um, then, then it's would fall within adaptation. If, if I can just expand on that, uh, my understanding as to why something like translation would fall under adaptation is because it's not a simple mechanical process where you take English, um, put it through a, a process and Afrikaans comes out the other end. Those of us who are not fluent in Afrikaans have seen what happens when you take words in English and use Google Translate. Sometimes what comes out on the other side is is, is not the actual Afrikaans translation. So in the translation process, there is some kind of skill, some kind of judgment call that is, that is made um, in giving effect to, so that the meaning of the original text carries through to the translated text. And we say, similar to that, if one is having to describe a picture or a graph or, or a graphic, it involves, similarly, it would involve some kind of skill and some kind of, um, work that is necessary to, to convey the meaning um, in an accurate manner. So does it become a translation simply because skill is involved? Is that the argument, Mr. Berger? Not that it becomes a translation, but that it becomes an adaptation. Adaptation. Correct. But, but the translation example gives us a, a way to, to understand um, what the act means when it talks about adaptation, but it's one, it's only one way um, in which adaptation may take place. Just a turn on, just, just to add, it. sorry, if I may just add on to that, um, I, I don't want to go into it, but in our, in our heads of argument, in our supplementary heads of argument, where we respond to um, the first amicus curiae submissions, um, we, we provide um, there are a number of academic articles on which we rely, uh, which go in in some depth to explaining why um, trans why a the making of an accessible format copy in a number of instances um, may not simply be a reproduction. 
But if it's an adaptation, then it's not translation. Is that right? An adaptation needn't be a translation, but a translation is an adaptation. It's one, it's one, one way in which an adaptation may be made. Thank you, Mr. Berger. Uh, Can so, I perhaps sorry. follow up on that, uh, Mr. Berger, please? Uh, I see in, in the definitions of adaptation in 1A4, interestingly, it deals with the question of pictures or photographs. It says a version of the work in which the story or action is conveyed only or many by means of pictures in a form suitable for reproduction. Now, I know there's this debate <clears throat> between you and the first amicus about reproduction as opposed to adaptation. And I just find it interesting that in 1A4, as part of adaptation, reproduction is included in that process which relates to pictures or photographs or, uh, or the like. <laughs> Any comment on that? Um, Justice Majit, if you can just give me one, one brief moment to, to just look through the text. It's 1A Roman 4. I'm, I'm not. I'm not, I'm not sure if the, if the question is saying that that in the context of that one would be limited by one four, and that anything where 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 it is where it is not. I'm suggesting. Amazing. Sorry, I'm suggesting, Mr. Berger, that it seems to me that adaptation, particularly in the context of the example you used uh, and uh, discussed with Justice Theron now, it seems that adaptation uh, is wider than reproduction and encompasses in some instances, for example, with a picture reproduction, but it's not necessarily the same. <clears throat> I, I, can't, I can't really really take, take that, that much further. I, um, the one, one point I would like, would like to, to make is, is that the, and what, what the academic literature often um, 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 shows us <laughs> is, is that Many copyright acts were adopted in a very different era, and this uh, this act itself comes from 1978, um, and I think, if, I, if memory serves correct, was only last amended in 2002. Um, and and so, what may originally have been contemplated um, as the kinds of examples. Um, of, of what the drafters had at the time of what constitutes an adaptation may not necessarily have kept up with developments um, in technology over the years. Um, and so while I, while I think the, the examples that are given um, are, are indicative and are, are helpful, they don't necessarily explain what the broad reach of, of, of what would constitute an adaptation of a work. Um, just as sorry, just as a general proposition, do you do you say in your answer, uh, your supplementary heads which were filed in response to the first amicus submissions, do you do you suggest that adaptation is indeed wider than reproduction? It's it's different. We submit that it it it's different, and that you you may well have in any particular instance both reproduction and adaptation that takes place um, in the, the making of the accessible format copy itself. Um, we, we also make the point um, that, that what the Marrakesh Treaty talks about is it's not limited to the issue of the making, but we're also then talking about distribution, we're talking about importing, exporting. Yes. Um, but, yes. But solely, in the, solely when one is dealing with the making of accessible format copies, um, depending on the nature of the work, depending on the format in which it is, depending on the nature of the accessible format copy that's been made, um, to some degree or another, you may have, you may only have reproduction or you may um, only have adaptation or you may have a, a combination of the two. It seems to me just uh, lastly on a, on a, on a plain uh, reading of the words that when you reproduce, you're simply copying something, you simply just, uh, 
producing it in another format. But if you adapt, adapt as adaptation is, is defined, you not only reproduce, but you go further than that, you are adapting it in some or other form uh, from its original content. So, so, so it seems to me that it is wider than reproduction, Correct. pure and simple. Correct. I accept that. Yes, that's absolutely yes. the case. Thank you. Thank you, Justice Butler. Thank you, Mr. Burger. Sorry, Mr. Mr. Burger. May, may, may I just come in here on, on this interesting debate, Mr. Berger? Um, if one has regard to the definition of reproduction, then it also contemplates in respect of artistic works, a process of uh, converting work. And if uh, reproduction contemplates the conversion of a work, then is it not arguable that the stark lines between reproduction and adaptation are not as clear and succinct as they may appear to be? Because the process of reproductions, at least definitionally, uh, contemplates, at least in respect of some works, a process of conversion and process of conversion is not purely a process of reproducing. Yeah. Justice Collipan, my understanding of the definition of reproduction um, and the way in which the act itself works, where, where it, it identifies what the nature of copyright is in respect of the different, different categories of works under copyright, um, and then itemizes the, the rights or the, what, what a holder of a copyright may do and consequently may exclude others from doing. Um, and then provides exceptions, generally provides exceptions um, in respect of each particular type of copyright, that where you have a definition of reproduction and it speaks about reproduction in relation to an artistic work, um, one must limit it to that. Um, and, and, and one is not talking about a, so for example, sub A of that definition talks about a, a literary or musical work. Um, and so an, art an artistic work, if, we, if we're talking about a, um, let, 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 if we're talking about a conversion from three, two dimensions into three dimensions, it may well be um, conversion from a, a um, building plan into a three-dimensional building itself. Um, I'm not sure how that, given that it's limited to artistic works, um, what that definition would then mean for literary works. Um, I accept that the, the, the definition does contemplate, at least insofar as artistic works are concerned, um, some, something that would be more akin to adaptation, but it does seem to be quite limited both to artistic works and to the movement between two-dimensional and three-dimensional and, and vice versa. No, I, I accept that, Mr. Berger. The only point I wished to make was that if one has regard to Section 13, then the idea of reproduction cannot be confined to simply a physical task of copying something, but that definitionally and in terms of your response, it may well extend beyond that to a conversion and a conversion may well um, border on what may constitute an adaptation. I'm saying that the, the definitions do not stand separately and uh, in stark contrast to each other. And I, and I think you, you accept that in a limited sense. Correct. If, if, if I might just add one, one thing to that. Um, the, the, the interesting thing about Section 13 is that unlike all the other exceptions, it, it is a, an exception that applies to, to all rights. And so, so we, we, we must accept that where it talks about reproduction, in respect of an, an artistic work, um, then it would would carry this that the, the term reproduction would carry this broader um, definition. the The question then is how much broader can it go? Um, and and we say that it it can't go as far as is necessary, both to cover the um, the making of all types of accessible format copies in all, all in all circumstances. Mr. Berger. If yes, I may, Justice, Justice Midlanger, uh, I want to take you to your pleaded case in the founding affidavit, because there's been a great deal of discussion about many features of the Marrakesh Agreement and uh, Section 19D. 
but and perhaps correct me if I'm wrong, the, the complaint that is made in the founding affidavit essentially concerns published material, which would essentially concern literary works. It doesn't talk about the problems of imports and exports, distribution, unpublished works, and a variety of other topics that are embraced under the remedies that you seek. So would you, would you just tell me what, what the pleaded case is as to what harm is created by the infringements that you complain of? Thank you, Justice Unterhalter. The, I think that to start, the, it's important to, to, to stress that this case was brought broadly on behalf of people with visual and print disabilities. So you're correct, it, it, wasn't, it wasn't brought on behalf of persons with other disabilities. Um, it, it was to some extent limited. These are the people who are before the court and we're seeking a remedy for them. And this is a remedy to end, essentially in, in, in shorthand, to end the book famine. Yes. Now, now the book famine is caused in a number of ways, um, which we set out in the heads of argument as to how the Copyright Act works so that it becomes difficult and in many or most instances almost impossible to secure permission to, to make an accessible format copy. But yes. how... What also, what all the, the, the pleaded case also speaks to is, is that what the applicants seek to do and what the Marrakesh Treaty, if fully domesticated, would permit them to do would be to engage in what Marrakesh refers to as cross-border exchange. Yes, but Mr. Berger, let me interrupt you. Uh, the, is there a case made out that there is an infringement of right for the failure to domesticate Marrakesh? Is that case made out in the founding affidavit? Because as I read your founding affidavit, it concerns essentially literary works and the book famine and the need to ensure that there is a, a basis for accessible formats to be freely available to uh, persons with uh, visual and print disabilities. That's Correct. the case. So, so, so why then are we considering the more expansive features of Section 19D, the Marrakesh Agreement, with the many aspects that those legislative interventions and treaty interventions contemplate. Why aren't we simply looking at a, a remedy that deals precisely with the complaint that is raised and is accepted as problematic constitutionally? Justice Unterhalter, I think it, it, it goes to to where would the access, how, how would my clients and or persons with visual and print disabilities in South Africa be able to access the accessible format copies that we want? And I think the case is made um, in, in the affidavits, including, for example, in, in um, Mr. Mr. Lowe's affidavit, where we explain where one would be able to source accessible format copies. And so the accessible format copies would be sourced, would be made both, both locally and abroad. And I'm not certain I've seen that the source of the book scarcity is the inability to import accessibly format works, nor that the problem is about unpublished works, nor that there is a problem about exporting works, nor that there are issues around distribution. I, I, I'd, I'd very much benefit from seeing where those aspects of the case are made out. Because if the case is more limited, then we can look at a remedy that is focused on the actual complaint that is made. Justice Unterhalter, if, if the remedy were to be limited to making accessible format copies in South Africa, then that would not solve the problem. Um, the vast majority of works that are currently available globally um, are in accessible format would be, for example, by, uh, would be accessed through organiza uh, organizations such as Bookshare, which is dealt with in some detail in Mr. Marcus's affidavit. If my clients or any person with visual and print disabilities were to 
import. We're, we're to import a, a whole host of books from Bookshare. They would fall foul of the provisions of the Copyright Act. Well, not uh, if not not if reproduction was permissible here under the uh, under twenty three uh, two. The, the the my understanding is that the manner in which Marrakesh operates is is that for now before we go to Mr. Marrakesh, Mr. Berger, let's deal with the act that you are seeking to uh, to 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 contend is unconstitutional, if. The reproduction, and you've raised the question about adaptation, but just in simple terms, if reproduction were permissible in South Africa under the Copyright Act by reason either of a remedy we would impose or perhaps under the regulation, let's just assume it's permissible, then why would importation of those works be unlawful under Section 23? It wouldn't be unlawful under Section 23, but there would be no source. The, it, the, the books would not be able, would, nobody would offer us the books for importation because for them, they would not be able to do so in terms of Marrakesh. But that deals with a different treaty question, which is reciprocity under the Marrakesh Agreement. And you've told us that your cause of action is not about the failure to domesticate Marrakesh. So you're trying to solve a problem that, that you haven't raised as a constitutional complaint. The, I think as far as I, I can take it, Justice Unterhalter, is that the, the papers make clear that the state's intention is, very, is to domesticate Marrakesh. The, state's, the, the state wishes to, um, to ratify and, and to to accede to the treaty, but it can only do so and will only do so once the act has been amended. Yes. Um, that, but for the president's referral of the, the bill as a whole back to the National Assembly, that the bill would have become law and the accession would yes. have taken But is your cause of action based on the referral back to parliament by the president or the failure of parliament to act quickly? I mean, these are, are, are perhaps legitimate complaints, but I don't read them in your founding affidavit. No, it, the, the, ca the, case is not, the case is not that Parliament has failed or that the state has failed to, to accede, but the case is, is that the state has failed to do what it says it needs to do in order to accede. Yes, thank you, Justice Madlanga. It looks like, uh, I'm sorry, it looks like uh, that's the end of the questions from my colleagues. Uh, uh, Mr. Berger, you still have a bit of time. Um, no, if you're no, just, 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 just Oh, there was a bit of silence, colleagues, I'm sorry. <laughs> Mr. <laughs> yeah, Mr. Yes, Mr. Berger, thank you, thank you. Uh, I just wanted you to, if you could, you may have touched on this point the argument by the first amicus that in fact, section 13 is sufficient for the reproduction of the uh, copies uh, to be converted. What do you say to that? Thank you, Justin. And, and, and that the only problem is that the minister has failed to make the regulations. So all that has to be done is for the minister to in fact promulgate the regulations and everyone should be happy once that is done. That's basically the gist of his argument on this aspect. Th thank you. Um, we have a number of problems with, with uh, the, the approach taken by the first amicus. And the first is the issue that, that I was debating earlier with, with some of the justices of the court as to whether or not reproduction goes far enough. And we say that in some cases, reproduction would go far enough, but not in all cases. And there are going to be a number of examples as the literature shows where, where reproduction alone is not enough and adaptation will be, would be required. And so the regulations themselves wouldn't be able to go as far as that. But we also, we also go further than that because we say that the, the regulations only deal with reproduction. They don't deal with a range of, well, the reproductions, the, 
so the regulations that the first amicus contemplates um, can't deal with anything other than reproduction. So it cannot deal with distribution, cannot deal with importation, cannot deal with exportation. Um, and so would only solve part of the problem. We have a fur two further difficulties with the regulations and that the first difficulty is, is, a, dif is, a, is a virus difficulty. And, and we submit that essentially the, the interpretation that the first amicus would have this court adopt is an interpretation that um, would see section 13 as essentially as the delegation of primary legislative powers from parliament to the, to the minister. And we've, we've looked at the, the regulations and we are mindful that one doesn't interpret regulation, doesn't interpret a section through the regulations. But if you look, for example, at regulation 9b, it's a regulation which deals with making copies of lodged building plans at the city council. So you're a homeowner and you want to make a copy of the plan that the previous owner submitted to the council. There are copyright vests in that plan. And what section 9b says is that the making of a copy of that so that you can then engage your architect and, and do your renovations, um, that making would not be um, a reproduction of that building plan would not be an infringement of copyright. And we think that's the kind of example what section 13 contemplates is, is really, it's, it's a mopping up type of provision which allows for the making of regulations on quite peripheral issues, but not on a fundamental issue. And that the, the particularly in a context where the act identifies what the nature of copyright is, specifies in relation to each type of copyright, where the exceptions lie, that a broad category of, of exceptions, such as the one we would like to see introduced to the Act, could be done by, by way of regulation. The, the, the final difficulty we, we have with, with Section 13 is that essentially what, you, what you're saying to persons with visual and print disabilities is that everyone else gets to exercise their rights immediately. Everyone else can simply buy a book um, off the shelf and read it. What you need to do is you need to wait for the minister to act further. Um, and if the minister doesn't act, you then need to take legal action to compel the minister to act. Um, the time, the resources that that, that brings with, it, with us. And we say that on its own, an, interpreta an interpretation like that um, offends the right to human dignity. Um, it's saying your, your rights are not as important as others. You can wait. Um, you can, you, your rights are subject to the whims of a minister who may or may not decide to make regulations. The last point I wish to make on this is that the regulations made in terms of Section 13 were last amended in 1985. Um, that, that really tells us um, that there is no intention to, to seek a remedy through that, through that way. Thank you. The last point that I'd like to raise relates to the proposed section 19D. The first amicus says it's too broad. How far should we, when, it, when it, we determine the reading in uh, that you seek, mm -hmm. do we have to entertain, do we have to consider the broadness of that section or should we leave that to parliament, that is to this process that the parliament is busy with? Thank you. That, that really does strike at the, the heart of where I think the disagreement lies. Um, the first amicus, our understanding is that the first amicus says that the provision is too broad because it goes beyond what the Marrakesh Treaty contemplates. And we don't disagree with on the facts. It does go beyond. So, for example, Marrakesh speaks about a beneficiary person and identifies who falls within that definition. And the definition of, of person with disability um, in, the, in the copyright amendment bill, which is in, in the, the definition section, but relied upon by 19D does go further than that. Um, we, we submit that there's no obligation on South Africa to, to legislate squarely in line with, with Marrakesh. South Africa has international human rights obligations under the Convention on the Rights of People with Disabilities. It has domestic constitutional obligations. 
And we would say that the kind of remedy that Parliament um, originally contemplated and is looking at now is a remedy that goes beyond Marrakesh precisely because, um, because of these domestic and international human rights obligations. And, and maybe just to give you an example of that, uh, for example, a, a movie um, would come with, could come with closed captioning or with subtitles, which would allow deaf person, per, persons who are deaf to, to enjoy it. That would be potentially um, how, the, how a broader um, provision would, would operate. Um, our, our position on, on what should be read in is simple. We, we are ourselves not 100% comfortable with 19D. And I'll give you an example of why not. If one looks at 19D1, 19D1 speaks about any person as may be prescribed. And so what that contemplates, the, the act is clear, prescribed means by, prescribed by regulation. So 19D would require the regulations made by the minister to say um, who may engage in the conduct that 19D1 contemplates. Um, we would be much more comfortable, for example, with a version similar or, or perhaps better than the version that Parliament, uh, that the committee published in December. This is the version that's contained in Annex OHD 9 um, to the first amicus's um, application for admission as amicus. Um, and there it, 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 it seeks to slightly amend um, sub one by removing the requirement for regulations. And it merely says any, any person who serves persons with disabilities, including an authorized entity, and then it gives a, a definition of authorized entity. So a long, a long, a long route to get to, to my point is that we came to, to seek 19D to, to be read in. We, we would be comfortable with, with the court reading, uh, giving us something better than that, but we recognize that a proper respect for the, the doctrine of the separation of powers would, would, would start off with saying that the, the legislative, legislative solution already passed by parliament and the one that is currently before the committee um, is, the, is the one that should be the subject of any reading and remedy. As, as things stand, we, we're not quite sure the, the process in the committee um, continues. Um, the draft amendments to section 19D that were published for comment in the beginning of December of 2021 have not yet um, in their, that form or in any amended form found their way in, 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 into any new um, docu version of the bill published by parliament. And so the, the, the version that is current, the latest version of the bill that is currently before parliament is B13B 2017. That's the copyright amendment bill as passed by parliament in 2019. So we would say given that that's the version that parliament is looking at and working on, um, it would be appropriate to make that version, uh, to, to read that version in, and then Parliament will always be free to, to amend it um, as part of its ongoing process of um, finalizing this bill. Mr. Beggar, thank you, Mr. Sister. We, we are one minute uh, beyond uh, your, your 45 minutes, but uh, <clears throat> I will... Uh, go um, against my what I said to, to council and chambers. I will not ask you at this point uh, how much more time you require. I will just let my colleagues uh, put questions to you and uh, it will only be when my colleagues are done that I will then ask you, do you still want more time? Thank you. Please, uh, please continue colleagues. Was it uh, Justice uh, Matopo? And here is I'm covered, Justice Matlanka. Thank you, my brother. Mr. Berger, <clears throat> I wanted to ask you about Section 23.2. Um, the first amici raises two objections. Oh, sorry, sorry. Blind essay raises two objections to the first amicus reliance on section 23.2. The first is that section 23.2 is silent 
on exports. Is that, is that right? Correct. If we assume that an appropriate section 13 exemption can permit the creation of accessible format copies, couldn't those exports be regulated by a further set of regulations that could be made under section 39? What's, are you able to check the questions here, do you, uh, what their pleaded case is? And why now they have expanded it? And then Matopo, mute yourself. This is Matopo, please mute yourself. Thank you, my brother. Sorry, uh, it, sorry, Justice Teron. Um, if I if I understand the the, the question correctly, you, you're saying that. The issue of exports, if that were to be dealt with, it could be potentially dealt with by regulations under 39. Yes, yes. Um, or I'm asking, why do you say they couldn't be dealt with by further regulations? The, the difficulty there is, is that, and it, it brings us to the, the ultra various point that, that we made earlier um, about, you know, uh, about the delegation of, 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 um, plenary legislative power. Um, the, and the, our understanding is that if section 13 were not to Look, be- there, Let me interrupt you. If, if let's proceed on the assumption that there's not a difficulty with the delegation of powers, what, what would your response be? The, the response would be that given the structure of the act and given the manner in which it works with exceptions, that to, to, to legislate an exception to exclusive rights and, and the first anarchist would characterize these as, as exclusive rights and property. Um, to grant an exception, one must either fall squarely within one of the exceptions that are expressly set out in the act or one must fall within the, the catch-all that applies to all categories of, of um, all types of, of works under copyright. Um, and that, that's in, in section 13. And if you can't bring yourself into either one of the um, work-specific um, exceptions or section 13, then you can't have regulations um, dealing with it. So the only... Assuming there's no problem. Section 13 empowers the minister to make additional exemptions. In respect of, of, a, of, of reproduction only. Yes, yes. The, the, and so if, if a case is made out before the minister that there needs to be an expansion to incorporate um, um, areas that have not been or not covered, um, why couldn't that meet the complaint laid by by Blind SA? Because a, an, an export would not be a reproduction. So the reproduction would have been made locally. And then for a cross-border exchange by way of export, that would not be permissible um, because that in itself would constitute an infringement. And, and Section 13 only allows the only category of, of exceptions that allows um, are reproductions. But, but you see, Section 23.2 is silent on exports. So couldn't Section 13 and Section 13 exemption cover additional exports or exports? Um, no, Justice. And I think if one, if one goes to... So if you can just bear with me for one moment. Um,
You see, Section 13 specifically says, in addition to rep reproductions permitted in terms of this act, reproduction of work shall be permitted as prescribed by regulation. Correct. So, so our understanding of that is Section 13 recognizes all the other exceptions in relation to reproduction that are granted in relation to each type of each work that is protected under copyright and says that over and above that, applying to all, you can also reproduce in the manner contemplated by the regulations made, and, and it would be the minister making the regulations. And the minister can allow additional exemptions, is that not right? Only for purposes of reproduction. He can't and go that beyond. Could also the relate to export. Why couldn't? Because Section Twenty Three is silent on export, that could also re, be governed, regulate exports. Um, Justice Tehran, I think one needs to read Section Twenty Three Two. Um, it, it, it must be read together with Section Twenty Three One. Um, copyright shall be infringed by any person not being the owner of the copyright who, without the license of such owner, does or causes any other person to do in the Republic any act which the owner has the exclusive right to do or to authorize. And then Section 23.2 gives a, a list, we would say a non-exhaustive list, of what are the types of, of infringement that, that may take place. The, the first amicus relies on 23.2 to, to say, as, as a way, as a positive way to say, well, an exception could also be granted to cover all of these. Um, and, and it is correct that 23.2 um, does not specially, um, does not identify exports but that does not mean that it creates a, a, an entitlement to export. Um, it's, just, it's just setting out the type of, types of examples that would constitute infringement. Well, we would we, that it would include that. Yes. What, what do you say about the argument of the first amicus that the rider in section 23.2 means that if a section 13 reproduction exemption is permitted, the persons can permissibly distribute and import accessible format reproductions of literally work, literary works. The, it, for us, it, it, it's at a conceptual level as well as at a practical level that, that there are difficulties with, with that argument. Um, we, accept the, we accept the argument, um, but, but the difficulty with that is that we have an act which on the first amicus's own view is dealing with rights and property. It, it gives a statutory entitlement to do anything and everything uh, with your work under copyright and to exclude others from doing what you're entitled to do. T Section 23 is, a, is, is titled infringement and deals with that issue. It, it, the, the proviso, so to, to have to try and find a way um, by looking through numerous provisions to try and make sense of what a provision which we submit was originally intended purely to, to cover um, the types of issues such as uh, Regulation 9b covers, we say is, is going to quite, quite a, a lot of heavy lifting needs to take place to interpret the provision so that um, act, acts other than reproduction can be, can be um, the subject of regulations in Section 13. The, 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 the other difficulty that, that we have um, is that is that a more practical level? Um, yeah. Sorry, that I'm just I'm not sure if you can. There is some some noise coming from outside, which 
uh, I'll see if my people can attend to it. Um, Yes, but you, you, you are clear. You are clear for now. Okay. Mr. okay. Thank you. If I may just step up and close my window, it might make a difference. I'm sorry about it. Someone in the parking lot um, speaking loudly on this on their car phone. Uh, um, I was I was going to to um, refer you to, to section 28, which is a provision that we mentioned in our supplementary heads of argument. Um, and that's a, a provision which, um, which restricts, which makes, which uh, for the restricting of importation of copies. And I, I'm not going to repeat that argument here, but the, the gist of the argument is, is that if you don't have an express, um, if you don't have express authority for allowing for imports um, in, in all circumstances, there is always the risk that Section 28 may be invoked. Um, and even if ultimately at the end of the Section 28 process, the products are released, um, that could, could, could cause a problem. Yeah, I'm not sure, Mr. Berger, that Section 28 renders the first amicus's argument unsust unsustainable because Section 28.2 provides that that section only applies if the copy would have, have been infringing a work made in the Republic. Now, if we, if we accept that conversion to an accessible format is reproduction and not adaptation, then a section 13 reproduction exam and if an exemption was made by the minister under section 13, then section 28 would not apply. That, that, what, do you that, say, what do you say about that? That, that, that is correct at, at the level of law. The question is in, in, in practice, um, how, how would that play out? Um, and, and the concern is, is that that may well be. Um, that, isn't the that, case, that isn't the case before us about law and whether the law is unconstitutional? That, that is the case that, that we have made. Um, the difficulty, what, what we're saying here is, is what, what we seek is a law, is, an, is, is a law that is clear and accessible to all and says, these acts are permitted, these acts are not permitted. What the, the approach that the first amicus is taking is to say, yes, but if you look at this provision, read with this provision, taking that provision, it, would, it doesn't apply. And so this, this um, you, you have nothing to worry about. Um, that type of legislative framework is quite anathema to, to the Copyright Act itself, which sets out in clear terms if you hold the copyright, you can do X, you can exclude others from doing X. And, and if you do X, then you, then you open yourself up to both civil and, and criminal um, sanctions. And, and it's the, criminal, the, criminal, the potential for criminal sanctions that, that is most of concern. I think many people may, may be quite willing um, if, 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 ne if need, if they had to, to to do something if, for example, they need, as in the case of Mr. Lowe, a, a textbook to, to study for his PhD, they may say, well, who, who ultimately is going to sue me for, patent, for copyright infringement? But if there's the faintest possibility of, of, of that conduct being, being, being criminalized, they, they would stay away. And so unless we say in that kind of a, in, in, in the context of that type of legislation, um, trying to source a right to make to make regulations um, by looking at all these other provisions um, really runs quite contrary to to what to the structure and of this act and, and and it really is trying to make the act do what the act was never intended to do and 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 with respect the act was never intended to address the 
the rights of persons with, with visual and print disabilities. Um, and it's always been the state's case that the act doesn't do that. And that the only way to make the act do that is by amending the act. I'm sure my learned friend, Ms. Raja Badlander will deal with that um, in, in, in her address. Yes. But just as to run, yeah. No, no, please proceed, sorry. please proceed. Um, even, even if they are correct on the issue of, of, the, of what reproduction includes, even if they are, are, are correct on the interpretation of 23.2 um, and, and what it allows, that still, it doesn't address the issue of, of unlawful delegation. And, and for that, we rely primarily on, on this court's judgment in the, in the AFRI business um, case, dealing with the um, preferential procurement regulations. And it doesn't address the, the question of the indignity that, that is brought about by everyone else being able to exercise their rights in terms of the act, but a marginalized community having to wait for a further process for their rights to be realized. Yes. My last question relates to remedy, Mr. Berger. I have a number of, of issues, difficulties regarding the remedy, but um, I'll just raise a few of them. Would the order need to ensure, or any reading in need to ensure, that it only permits authorized persons to make accessible format copies. If we didn't do that, wouldn't the reading in constitute an unreasonable intrusion on the legitimate interests of copyright holders? Sorry, Justice Turan, could you re repeat the, the first part of the question? Yes, should the reading in not only permit a certain authorized group of persons to make format copies, accessible format copies. And if we don't do that, wouldn't that be an intrusion in the interests of copyright holders? The, the remedy that we came to court to ask for is a remedy to read in Section 19D as it currently um, operates, um, and as it well not as it well as it currently reads in in the amendment bill, as it is intended to operate in the, sometime in the future. Yes. Well, well, te technically, given the immediate reading in by Justice Mbongwe, um, Section 19D is currently in force. Um, it hasn't been used as yet, but it is currently in force. Isn't the situation is that it won't be in force until? It's confirmed by this court. No, my understanding is that in, in terms of the, 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 I think it's section 172, which entitles a, a high court to grant interim relief pending the outcome of a constitutional the confirmation proceedings, that was in terms of that, that we sought the, the reading in to be, to be granted. Um, but but that, that really is, is neither here nor there. Um, so the remedy that we sought um, is limited to authorized persons. And so the section 19D says any per person as may be prescribed, and that would then be the, the, is, the regulation. Is that, is that what the proposed or the order says, any person as may be prescribed? That's the text of 19D, and that's what we, we, we came to court um, to, to argue. Um, so how, how do we ascertain who is prescribed? It's for the, unfortunately, it would be for the minister to, to make further regulations to, to identify who may be prescribed. Um, so it, it, it does, to some extent, it would limit the, the application of Section 19D. Um, but there are other provisions, um, such as the importation provisions, which, which could now, kick in. If, if, until such time as the minister makes the regulations, what would the position be? that the making of accessible format copies in terms of 19D1 would not be permissible. One would, but what would be permissible would be imports. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Um, Berger. Justice, if, if I can just expand yes. on that, if I may. Um, we, we also make the submission that um, if this court were to come to the conclusion that the rights of persons with print and visual, with, 
right? So p- persons with um, visual and print disabilities were not to be vindicated by the reading in of that. This court has the, the jurisdiction to grant a, a broader order and, for the, and authority for that would be the, the um, EFF case on, on, on which we rely. The, what your question touches on, you, as part of your question, you spoke about the, legit, the interests of, of copyright holders. But what, and there are, two, there are two answers to that. The first is an answer that takes me back to, to Marrakesh. And what Marrakesh contemplates is, in terms of the making of accessible format copies, beneficiary persons are entitled to make, persons who serve persons with, uh, beneficiary persons are entitled to make, and authorized entities are entitled to make. And that's the international consensus on the issue. And the second point we wish to make is that copyright holders lose nothing if copy if accessible format copies are to be made. The reason why a provision like section 19D is needed in the first place is because the copyright holders themselves are not making accessible format copies. So there may well, there is a market for those copies. They're not satisfying that market. And so the only thing that would be taken away from them um, if a broader reading in provision were to, to be made would be the right to exclude others from doing something that they have no intention of themselves doing. And so whether it's an, a beneficiary person who, as far as we understand, the only way in which a beneficiary person would be able to make an accessible format copy for themselves would be if they happen to be lucky enough to own a braille printer. Um, and they would then be able to take, for example, a word version of the document and print it in braille, which is understand how Justice Jakub used to, how his um, print, um, his documents would be made available to him. Or a beneficiary, uh, a person would do it on behalf of someone or an authorized entity. And by expanding the, the, the group of persons who, who may make the copies, um, it has no practical effect on copyright holders. It takes nothing away from them, but for their right to say, because we can, we choose not to allow you to do X, Y, or Z. And that with respect is not the reason why copyright is granted. Copyright is not granted to allow the holders merely to exclude for no good reason. It's granted um, for a broader public purpose. Just as in in the example of uh, under the Patents Act, where you grant protection for inventions you do it so that the product is brought to market. You don't, you don't give the, the, the protection to, with, 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 on the understanding that the right will be exercised in a manner uh, where, where the invention is never brought to market. That, under the, under the Patents Act, would constitute an abuse of rights. Um, so, so getting back to, to your point about the rights of, of copyright holders, they lose nothing if the category of persons who are entitled to, to make accessible format copies is broadened. Thank you, Mr. Berger. Thank you, Justice Madlanga. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sir. Mm. Uh, Mr. Berger, oh. I'm yes, sorry, uh, I'm yes, sorry, no? Justice Madlanga. Uh, no if I might no just uh, uh, ask Mr. Berger one or two follow-up questions. Mr. Berger, uh, I'd, I'd, I think we'd all benefit if you could uh, make your answers as, uh, as, as short as you can whilst doing justice to the question that is asked in the interest of time. Uh, I wanted to ask a, f- a few questions about remedy. Uh, you, you say, I think with some justification, that uh, those that you represent should not have to wait for the constitutional infringement that you complain about to be remedied. Um, And that's part of the criticism you level at the question of uh, regulations under Section 13. What would prevent this court under its uh, remedial jurisdiction from making an order that the minister would pass these regulations, promulgate them within a period of time, or conceivably even put up a version of the regulations that Professor Dean has suggested as the remedy? I will try and be brief. Um, the, if I can start with this, the second issue, and then that is the version put up by Professor Dean. We submit that that would be quite, an in, quite invasive to use his text, where where the legislative solution that was originally adopted and that parliament ultimately will adopt 
is a solution based on 19D. And so well, let me stop you there. What, one of the things that you said about the reading in is that uh, that there was uh, that there was no constraint on South Africa legislating in ways that go beyond Marrakesh. That's true, but that's not what courts are there to do. That's what the legislature is there to do. So I, I, I on the one hand, you want us uh, to have a very expansive reading in as an exercise of our powers. On the other hand, when it comes to the regulation, you say we're being we're going too far because that is trampling on a ministerial prerogative to pass the right kind of regulations. Well, can you have it both ways? What, what we would say, though, is, is that the starting point should be the text of 19D. And to the extent that this court were to agree with in the, any of the submissions that the first amicus makes on, on why, and, and the, the submissions are made in the context of Marrakesh, as to why it shouldn't, it goes too far, then a cutting back could be made. So instead, for example, of using person with disability, um, the text of 19D to be read in would read beneficiary person. So we would say the starting point, which is more respectful of separation of powers, would be to take the text as parliament has chosen, rather than to take a text originating from one person. I'm not clear why it's respectful of separation of powers. There's a legislative process underway where there will be consideration given to 19D and other amendments. Why is that our province? That's the legislature's province. We must find a remedy that cures the particular constitutional infringements that you have shown. The, all of the respondents in this case are comfortable with the text of, of 19D. If this court, we would say, is, 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 is not convinced that 19D, if 19D goes too far, then it should cut back on 19D. And it may well be influenced, if it were to do that, by the submissions made by the first amicus. But, but precisely because this court should not act as a um, act as a, as as a legislature, it it should take its guidance from what the respondents are saying is the appropriate text. And if there are any particular concerns with that text, then to, to deal with those, rather than to take as its starting point a text that has not come out of the department or out of the legislative process. The, yes. If I can get back to, to the, yes, the original please. question, um, the, we did not bring the, a case um, to, to argue that the minister um, has failed in his constitutional obligations to give effect to the rights of persons with visual and print disabilities by failing to make regulations in terms of section 13. And so in that context... No, plainly, think, because you don't think he has the competence to make right. the regulations that would be necessary. But assuming you were wrong, what would stop the relief that I have posited to you as a possibility? In other if, words, at mandamus requiring the minister to act within a very limited period of time. Uh, submit that there would, there would be nothing because what this court can, we submit cannot do is everyone is agreed that there is something wrong with the legislative framework as a whole, regardless of where the source of that problem is. Everyone has ag agreed that there needs to be a, a remedy. And if this court were of the view that the remedy um, must come through that way, as opposed to through an amendment to the act, um, it could do that. The, ultimately, the minister would be bound by that, but if parliament chose to stick with the legislative solution, with the, 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 the statutory, the solution in terms of the, an amendment to the Copyright Act, it would be free to, to amend the act in that way and the regulations would, would, would no longer have any force. Yes, and then just lastly, a follow-up question from some of the uh, questions my sister, Justice Teron, was asking you. If reproduction was permissible and importation was permissible by reason perhaps of uh, Section 13 regulation, what is the prohibition under the Copyright Act against the export of such reproduced copies that would have taken place under a scheme uh, created by regulation through Section 13? 
Where does the prohibition arise from? Because that's not one of the features of section six. Correct. I, I did go back to section six and I had understood that section six may, may, um, may do that, but, but you are quite correct that section six um, doesn't give that as one of the rights to copyright holders. So that I have to concede on that point. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Berger. Thank you. Thank you, Justice Matlonga. Mr. Berger, just a small one from me, Justice Matlanga, with your permission. Um, it, it's slightly related to the separation of powers issue that Justice Untalda raised with you. Aren't, we, aren't you asking us to prescribe to Parliament when you say we must read in this version of Section 19D? Aren't you inviting us to prescribe to them uh, and that when they finally come around to finalizing this process, that they can reformulate what we would have read in. Isn't that a problem? Uh, please allay my fears in that regard. Uh, thank you, Justice Mlambo. The, the version of the bill that is currently before parliament is the version that, that we, oh, let's say the version of section 19D that the committee is currently working on is exactly the uh, version that we seek uh, a reading and remedy of. And that was, the, that was the version that was originally enacted. That's the version that, that will be the basis of whatever ultimately comes out of the legislative process. And a reading and remedy from this court would, would simply put that into play, in, in, into law in the interim and would not tie parliament's hands in any way to, to amend um, the act, um, to amend that provision as part of its current process. So, so that, that's, that's the first answer to the question. The second answer to the question is the respondent, we cited all the, 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 the respondents precisely because of this. So we've cited the speaker as she, the speaker is the third respondent, the chairperson of the National Council of Provinces, and they've all they all chose to abide by the relief we sought in the High Court and, and in this court, and that is the reading of 19D in that form. So Parliament itself has no problem with this. The only person who has a problem with, with the reading in of 19D is the first amicus. So, the so you, you, say, the yeah, you say, even if we were to give you the relief you seek to read, to read it in, as you suggest, in the, as it appears in the current text, Parliament would still be free to reformulate it further in its Absolutely. processes, you say. Absolutely. And, and Parliament has already indicated, um, well, the committee has indicated um, in its version that it published for comment in December um, that, that, it, um, that it is looking at, at a, a minor amendments to 19D. There would also be, beyond the, beyond the National Assembly phase, because the bill has been retagged as a Section 76 bill, Effectively, what that means is that when it gets to the NCOP, the, the process has to start afresh. And so the entire bill um, gets, gets the NCOP and they, they, would, they, they would be free to do what they wish uh, with, with it, obviously subject to how that then has to be reconciled at the end. But, but nothing that this court were to do by way of a reading in remedy would tie Parliament's hands. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Justice Matlando. I'm, I'm sorry, Ms. Justice Madlunga, may, may I just have a quick follow-up? Uh, Mr. Berger. Sorry. Mr. Berger. Yes, I'm, I'm here. I'm listening. Uh, um, I... I'm not certain I follow that argument uh, that you've just made, and it could be a matter of some importance. If, if by order of this court, we read in section 19D, how do we not tie the hands of parliament? Assume, assuming parliament through the committees has a change of heart and they now think that there's a problem with 19D because it makes the ratification of Marrakesh problematic. So they wish to reformulate it in significant ways. But there's an extant order from this court that says that 19D will be the prevailing legislation. H how does parliament go about amending our order? 
I, I don't understand a reading in remedy to, to work in that fashion, Justice Unterhalter. My understanding and, and, and the jurisprudence of this court is, is, is quite clear um, in many of the cases dealing with reading in remedies that, that once a reading in remedy is granted, parliament is always free to amend the text as read in by the court and that its hands are never tied. Um, and so the fact that there is a legislative process already underway, um, as opposed to one that may be contemplated or one that is not necessarily on the cards but comes years later, shouldn't make any difference to that basic proposition that once read in, um, and a provision can always be amended, provided, provided it's done in a constitutional way. Yes, well, it's, it's that last rider that's the important feature of this. If 19D is necessitated by the constitutional infringements that you complain about, a matter that I've already raised with you, then aren't Parliament's hands tied? I, I would say not, because we're, we're not saying that, that the... the, the that the only way in which to vindicate the rights of, of our clients is by way of the reading in of 19D and nothing else. What we're saying is that a provision such as 19D is, is one that needs to be read in. Um, and the reason we selected 19D is because that was Parliament's own solution and not to, to stray from that. So not, not to come up with any other wording. The, it would always be, um, an interim reading in, however one calls it, it's alt interim in the sense that Parliament always has the right to, to amend. Um, the, the final point I wish to make is, is related to sec text section two, 237 of the Constitution. Um, and the, if, if one takes, I understand, if one takes your, the position that one, Parliament's hands will be tied by any reading in remedy that this court were, were to grant then, then essentially what this court is saying is that there can be no reading in remedy. Um, and that then would violate section 237 of the constitution. The, our clients would just have to, have to await um, the, the outcome of the parliamentary process. Um, but there, I think ev everyone, so all the parties before this court and the amici before this court are of the view that there is a problem with the legislative framework and there is a need for reading in. The only question is where, the only questions are what is the source of the unconstitutionality and what is the text of what should be read in, but some text ought to be read in. And we say to be respectful of the parliamentary process and the, the decisions that have been taken by all the respondents um, in moving that parliamentary process forward, um, the, least, the, 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 the remedy that least disturbs and least offends the principle of the separation of powers is one that takes the solution that Parliament has already crafted, and that but for the President's referral would today be law. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Justice Mabwana. You. It looks like... Yes. Uh, no, I have... Oh, sorry, oh. Justice Mabwana. Yes, yes, my brother. Uh, Mr. Berger, Section yes. 19D, as it stands, is it compliant with the Marrakesh Treaty and other treaties? And if not, how will it assist the applicants uh, going forward in terms of their engagement globally? And as you would understand, if it is not compliant with the, the Marrakesh Treaty and the other treaties, uh, that would be some form of limitation on them in terms of the reproduction, importation, and exportation. And secondly, that I would want to find out from you, how far, if you know, is Parliament with the process? And it, the, my question talks to, to the delay mm -hmm. and also whether in the interim, should the status quo remain and the minister be nudged uh, to invoke uh, his powers in terms of section 13 and section 39, that is to enact the regulations if the process is too far? Thank you. 
Thank you, Justice Matopo. I think I think to start off with, I, I, we have we have a difficulty with um, with speaking about compliance with with Marrakesh because Marrakesh, in our understanding, um, provides a floor, not a ceiling, and if South Africa were to legislate strictly in accordance with Marrakesh, then there would be no problem whatsoever with accession to Marrakesh. But we would say that the international law, the, the, the international law framework, which includes Marrakesh, includes Bern, includes TRIPS, but also um, international human rights law, such as the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, doesn't require South Africa to legislate only in accordance with Marrakesh, but that we can go beyond Marrakesh. And in fact, as, as, the, as our supplementary heads of argument show, that is precisely what many countries who have acceded to Marrakesh have done. Um, they've gone beyond the, the text of Marrakesh. What Marrakesh does is essentially it says to you if you, if, you come, if you align your laws exactly with Marrakesh, then you're automatically through the door. But it doesn't mean that you can't get through the door um, in other ways, and that you cannot comply with the three-step test, whether it's under Bern or under the TRIPS agreement, um, in any other way. But if you comply with Marrakesh, then you have complied with both of those three-step tests. So we say there is no going beyond Marrakesh is not a problem. Um, and not only is it not a problem, but it's a requirement because of South Africa, because of our the constitution, and also because of our international obligations, which obviously have, have an impact on the interpretation of, of the constitution. The, in terms of the parliamentary process, um, my, my understanding is, is that there, there were a number of submissions that were made um, following the, the um, publication in early December of that version of 19D um, that's in Annex OHD9 to uh, Professor Dean's um, affidavit. Um, and I'm not, not sure when the, the, the portfolio committee is next meeting, but they haven't as yet processed those, um, those submissions. And so we're now, we're in, we're in mid-May, uh, mid, mid, next month we will already be two years since the referral by, by the president, and we're still in committee stage, and we're still dealing quite narrowly with a um, with the the constitutional concerns that the president sent back to parliament once it gets through the na then it needs to go to the national council of provinces and because it's a section 76 process it then needs to go to the the province the provincial legislatures and the, the public consultation processes that they may then take and so if it's taken us two years to get to still be in committee we're not we're not sure um, We, we, we're, not, we're not sure how much longer it's, it's going to take, um, probably longer than that. And so even the two years that the, well, let me not get to the suspension issue, but two years will probably not be enough um, for parliament to finalize this process. It's a process that's been ongoing um, since 2011, um, when the WIPO report to which our, which, to which our um, founding affidavit makes reference uh, which first identified the need for a provision such as this was first brought Mr. together. Becker, Mr. Becker, let me, let me interrupt you. I think the point is well made about the delay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Becker, um, please uh, wrap up. I would imagine that you must have covered virtually everything now, perhaps through your responses to, to the questions by my colleagues. Uh, thank you, Justice Madlanga. I think I, I have overstayed my welcome. There's just one, one last point I wish to make. And how um, much time do you want for that? 30 seconds. <laughs> and that, right. that, that point is that the, the obligations that are binding on South Africa now under the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities bind the Republic as we speak. Um, whatever obligations as they may be under Marrakesh do not. Um, and so... So we, what, we cannot wait, um, and the state certainly cannot wait um, any longer to discharge um, its, its obligations under the CRPD. Those, those are our submissions. 
Thank you very much, Mr. Berger. We'll take a 15 minute adjournment. We'll resume at 11.51. Court adjourn. Court will adjourn until 11.51. Please note that during the adjournment, you are welcome to switch off your video and mute your microphone and then rejoin with video and sound when the hearing recommences at 11.51. Should you exit, you may use the same link to rejoin the hearing.
Let us please come back on. We should be starting now. Ms. Jones? Justices of the Constitutional Court, all counsel are online. Thank you. Yes, Mr. Powell? As it pleases the court, Justice Madlanga, Justices, uh, we have a brief roadmap to our submissions. We intend to present three arguments detailed in our application for admission. And briefly, those are, we expand on the domestic and international human rights law applicable to the rights of freedom of expression, and more importantly, the freedom to receive and impart ideas and the challenges occasioned by the Copyright Act in relation to the full realization of those rights for persons with visual and print disabilities. Secondly, we engage in the, the present debate around legislative exemptions and we bring this court's attention to foreign law, which provides that uh, more often than not, exemptions for persons with uh, visual and print disabilities are found through legislative protection, as opposed to discretionary regulatory allowances from members of the executive. And then thirdly, we address remedy directly and the importance of section 237 of the constitution um, on the facts before this court in this matter. Briefly then, and just in response to the debate between Mr. Berg and Justice Unterhalter, Justice Unterhalter, for your benefit, on the question around um, interim reading in and the ability of this to be uh, amended by Parliament, there is some jurisprudence from this court. And just for the Justice's reflections, it's paragraph 120 of the majority decision of Justice and Kluntler in Center for Child Law versus Media 24 and others. Citation is 2019 ZAC 46. And that's at paragraph 120. Turning then, Justice Madlanga, to the first of our submissions on the domestic and international position. Media Monitoring Africa submits that alongside the rights um, that the applicant suggests are impugned by the Copyright Act. Inequality in the ability to receive and impart information and ideas in terms of Section 16.1b is relevant to this court's inquiry as to whether or not the Copyright Act is unconstitutional. We cite in our heads of argument um, statements by this court in both print media and Quelane. But for the sake of our submissions today, we seek to bring this court's attention to three international instruments which are relevant in this regard. Firstly, Article 21 of the Convention of the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, which reaffirms the right um, of persons with vision and print disabilities to receive and impart information and ideas under the purview of freedom of expression. Now we note that both the applicant and the third amicus curiae cites articles 34, 30, and 9 of the convention, but we seek to bring article 21 to this court's attention as well in its considerations. And we can confirm that this is a treaty that has been um, signed by the executive on the international plane. It has been ratified. More importantly then, in turning particularly to persons with disabilities, we draw this court's attention to Article 23 of the 2018 Protocol on the African Charter on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. And here in reaffirming the right to receive information and ideas, Article 23 enjoins states to take policy, legislative and other measures 
to ensure that these rights can be exercised on an equal basis and with others. Equally, Principle 7 of the 2019 Declaration of the African Commission on Freedom of Expression and Access to Information enjoins states to take specific measures, particularly for marginalized groups, inclusive of persons with disabilities. So we submit in considering whether or not the Copyright Act is unconstitutional. This court in terms of section 31, um, 39.1b must consider, and the extent of the obligation is only to consider the international law position in as, in, in as much as it asserts this court in an interpretive injunction to interpret section 16.1b, which we suggest is one of the rights in the Bill of Rights that is at the heart of this particular matter. Turning then to the use of legislative exemptions in foreign comparable jurisdictions to resolve the tension between copyright owners and persons with visual and print disabilities, we argue that foreign law is illustrative, that legislative exemptions are a well-established, practical, meaningful, and inclusive solution to the pre-existing tensions that arise. It at that point, uh, Mr. Power, my colleagues may put questions uh, to you now, but uh, do continue. As it pleases the court. Presiding Justice, Justices, we cite in our heads of argument four examples, being the Canadian Copyright Act, the United Kingdom's Copyright Designs and Patents Act, the Brazilian Copyright Regime, which is found in Law 9610, and the Ugandan Copyrights and Neighboring Rights Act. We note equally that the first amicus curiae in responding to our written submissions cites the laws of Germany, Singapore, Spain, and Thailand. And for the purposes of our submission here, the takeaway point is simply that in all of these jurisdictions, exemptions are encapsulated in a legislative protection as opposed to a discretionary regulation. We also bring this court's attention to the 2019 revised scoping study on access to copyrighted works by persons with disabilities prepared by the World Intellectual Property Organization. And here, we do not seek to introduce expert opinion on foreign law. We seek only to draw this court's attention to page 21 and a table which documents the prevailing foreign law position. And that is simply that 28 countries have copyright legislation that provides exemptions for all disabilities. 24 countries have copyright legislation which includes exemptions for persons with visual and print disabilities. And 72 countries have copyright legislation that provides an exemption for persons with visual disabilities beyond print and text works. Now, the point we seek simply to address here is that legislative protections are the comparative foreign law trend as opposed to regulatory discretions by members of the executive. This court uh, will recall that the first amicus curiae takes exception to our introduction of foreign law. And in this regard, we seek to bring this court's attention to two authorities. The first is the Center for Child Law case, which I cited earlier in our submission. And at paragraph 110 of that case, Justin Plantler reminds us, and for a majority of this court finds that the respondents argue that there is no uniform approach in foreign statutes. While this may be so, it is helpful to seek guidance from foreign jurisdictions. This does not mean that we must necessarily adopt what others do, and that we can only adopt an approach if it is uniformly applied in foreign jurisdictions. And importantly, we turn to foreign law to gauge, to learn, and to understand what options are available elsewhere, and to consider if they would work, importantly in South Africa's unique context. So that's- the power, uh, uh, I don't think, I certainly need any persuasion about the importance of looking at foreign law and uh, the assistance it might give us. But there is a difference between legislative processes that have been followed by parliaments in other countries 
and cases where a legal challenge of the kind that is being brought in this case has resulted in remedies of the kind that you support. Can you give us a court case where the kind of expansive uh, remedy that is sought here has been adopted? Justice Adolta, we cannot. Um, we have not been able to identify. I'm just uh, wondering if, if that's the case. It's, it's, of course, we can look at legislative designs all over the world, and they're no doubt informative and helpful, but we are not a legislature. So the, the question for us is a much narrower one. It's not, we don't have choices about legislative design because we're not a legislature, we're a court. So it would be helpful to, to understand from your perspective what, what our remedial remit is in the, in the light of the infringements that are, 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 are advanced here. Well, Justice Interhalter, the reason we introduce foreign law is simply to bring this court's attention for the purposes of relief that the prevailing trend is legislative protection as opposed to the enactment of discretionary. But we are not a legislature. So, so, so are you telling us that our powers are to legislate? No, Justice Indalta, not at all. What I'm suggesting that to the extent that this court seeks to read in a remedy, we would suggest that 69, uh, section 19D, the proposed section 19D of the Copyright Amendment Law, is more appropriate than the regulations that are affixed to the founding affidavit of the first amicitura. And we suggest that, that in the event to remedy the constitutional defects, which we suggest um, are, are clear in this particular matter, where a reading in takes place, legislative protection should be preferred as opposed to regulatory protection. Even if that legislative protection is, is presently the subject of debate before parliament where there are constitutional and other objections that are being raised and debated there? Well, Justice Antalta, our position simply and our instruction is that whichever remedy this court seeks to craft, it should have immediate effect. And that might, yes. might either be through an interim reading and or a final reading. And we suggest in aligning with the applicant that 19D is, so to speak, the path of least resistance. In the but Mr. Power, you're not, you're not dealing with, with respect with the question I'm putting to you. There is a process before parliament. There is a provision there which is being debated. There is some controversy as to that provision and various persons, including legislators, has, uh, have got issues as to where to finally land on that issue. So in the light of all of that, is, is it still within our remit to simply adopt the current legislative position that, uh, that is before parliament? Well, Justice Antalta, our submission is that this court um, is well within its power to issue remedies that are just and equitable. And we suggest in the third part of our submission that the tipping point in this particular matter is Section 237, which, as this court found in the 2014 Kumalo decision, elevates the duty on organs of state to perform expeditiously and without delay to a constitutional obligation in and of itself. So what we argue is given that there is presently no exemption that provides for access for persons with visual and print disabilities, and given that there has now been over a decade's worth of delay in the Copyright Amendment Law, and over 44 years since the enactment of the Copyright Act, we suggest that given that these significant constitutional deficiencies are at play, this court is well within its remedial power to introduce a remedy that ensures that persons with visual and print disabilities have immediate access to print and visual works. So to reaffirm what- I don't happened, think that's controversial. The question is, what is the scope of the remedy? Not that a remedy should be granted to permit these problems to be remedied. Justice Antalta, we, can, we cannot take the position further. Simply our position and role as amicus in this particular matter is to reaffirm some of the international law positions that have been omitted and to assist this court with guidance on the foreign law position, which reaffirms legislative protection 
and the importance and argue the central importance of Section 237 to this case. We submit that the state has failed in that obligation. And this court as the ultimate guardians of our constitution is enjoyed to intervene and act. In terms of direct remedy, our only instruction is that it should have immediate effect. So if this court is with us on the question of whether or not the Copyright Act is in fact constitutional, uh, unconstitutional, there should be a declaration of unconstitutional validity. Now that declaration may well be suspended provided there is an interim reading in which vindicates the rights uh, for persons with vision and print disabilities at a, as a matter of urgency. So that is the extent of, of our instruction, Justice Unterholzer. We are not firm on the position of final or interim relief, but we do suggest that an interim reading in, in light with the discussions that Justice Unterholzer and others have had with Mr. Berger, is a potentially a just and equitable remedy for this court to pursue in this matter. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you, Justice Midlanger. Mr. Mr. <clears throat> Power, uh, I, I want to understand uh, your preference uh, at the level of constitutional principle. Assuming that um, we did not have the debates that we are having around, uh, let me loosely say, sufficiency uh, of um, what of the discretionary power provided for in section 13. Sufficiency in the sense that does it sufficiently provide for the required uh, cover? Let us say we did not have any uh, debates around that. Um, would you still say that uh, something like this should not be provided for uh, in terms of an executive discretionary power, but rather through legislation by, by parliament. I just want to see how far your argument goes in this regard. Thank you, Justice Madlang. And our position would uh, remain that legislative protections should be the point of departure, which may enable further regulation. But as a primary point of departure versus a persons with vision and print disability should have legislative protection, which allow them to vindicate their rights, as opposed to living in hope of a ministerial discretion as exercised by resolution. So our position remains that read with foreign law, and if this court accepts the international law position in its interpretation of section 16.1b, our position remains that the appropriate course of action is a legislative exemption. And that is simple. Uh, Justice Berger touched on it. One, for the sake of visual and print disabled persons being able to vindicate their rights through legislation as opposed to regulation. And more importantly, Justice Madlanga, is the question of dignity and the right for all people to live a meaningful and informed life. Should some members of our community need to plead for the exercise of discretion and inequality flows, and it is for that reason that we suggest that legislative protection is the preferred approach as this court proceeds to consider it. Turning then, and um, just uh, to complete my, my point on foreign law, I'm cognizant of the time constraints and I don't intend to be too much longer. But the only additional point to bring in um, is the relevance of the Venice Commission. So there has been contestation, as we've indicated, about foreign law. Uh, Justice Majid recently in Quelane advises that the court has relied on its Venice Commission um, engagements to understand more fully the foreign law position. And why we submit that this may be a useful approach in this particular instant matter is one, to confirm the position of legislative protection, but equally in the event that this court would like to have sight of the drafting styles um, of the various legislation which carves out these exceptions. Moving then to our final point, Justice Madlanga, and this pertains to section 237 of the constitution. I've already reaffirmed the position that this court adopted in Kumalo in relation to elevating diligent compliance and expeditious compliance with constitutional obligations to the level of a constitutional obligation in and of itself. And here the citation for the benefit of the court is Kamalo and another versus Minister of the Executive Council. It's 2013 ZAC 49 at paragraph 
112. And we suggest that on a balance and consider, uh, considered within the totality of this case, Section 237 may well be the tipping point in which this court uh, moves towards an interim reading in and authorizes the immediate effect of these exceptions so that persons with vision and disabilities have sufficient and most, more importantly, equitable access. Lastly, on this particular point, is jurisprudence that we seek to remind this court of from Doctors for Life. And it goes directly to the debate that Justice Unterholzer and I was having about how far this court should extend potentially um, into either the legislative or executive domain. And here, Justice Noble at paragraph 70 provides that, and if the process of performing their constitutional duty, courts intrude into the domain of other branches, that intrusion is mandated by the constitution. What courts should strive to achieve is the appropriate balance between their role as the ultimate guardians of the constitution and the rule of law, including any obligation that parliament is required to fulfill in respect of the passage of laws. And our argument here is simple. We argue that in light, with two, uh, in light of section 237, parliament has not, and as, as a you, result. As you begin to explain your argument in that regard, uh, your time is up. How much more time do you want? Justice Malanga, I'm moving to closing, so two minutes uh, to the two extent minutes. that- Two minutes you get, uh, Mr. Power. As it pleases the court. Then in closing, uh, presiding justice, justices, through our submissions, we have expanded on the additional domestic, uh, foreign and international law applicable to this matter. And the violence in our argument that the Copyright Act does to the ability of persons with visual and print disabilities to access information, ideas and knowledge and to exercise their expressive rights both on and offline. It is clear and it is common cause between the parties and two of the amici at the root of this violence is clearly the Copyright Act, and as a result, a declaration of constitutional invalidity must ordinarily flow. Simply in our submission, no person should be left behind. It is also clear that a suitable remedy must be crafted to bridge both the physical and digital divide to ensure that persons with visual and print disabilities can share in the knowledge and ideas of all. Relying on section 237, we emphasize the obligation on the state to perform its obligations without delay, and we note that it has failed to do so in this instance. As a result, and read within the totality of this case, uh, Media Monitoring Africa aligns itself with the position of the applicant with either an interim or final reading in of the proposed section 19b, and does so to ensure that the uh, physical and digital divide no longer persists and that persons with visual and print disabilities have equitable access to all necessary resources. Justice Madlanga, if there is nothing further from the justices of the court, those are our submissions. Thank you, Mr. Power. Yes, Mr. Suleiman. What please, Justice Madlanga, justice of the court. As it stands, copyright holders are gatekeepers to accessing reading materials for people with disabilities. Our core submission as the ICJs is that the Copyright Act falls short of South Africa's international obligations and that South African copyright law must be considered through a human rights framework. And this means that the Copyright Act fails to fulfill international law obligations to actively remove legis legislative and other barriers to promote access to materials for people with disabilities. Now, justice is a, a remedy that creates an exception that immediately removes such a barrier, shall fulfill such an obligation. And we accept that the debate has now moved on to a scope of a remedy. But these obligations in terms of the Convention on the Rights of People with Disabilities and the International Convention on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, which South Africa have both ratified and bound by, lay out what these obligations are. And they have been dealt with in today's proceedings and extensively in our written submissions, and we will not go extend to them. And so our submissions today seek to assist this court with two questions. The first is how will the Vienna Convention 
assist this court in considering a broader, more even and harmonized body of international law when considering interpreting the Copyright Act. And the second is why we submit that a remedy such as a provision of sec as, uh, as, as section 19D, pardon me, further South Africa's international co and constitutional obligations. But it, focusing on the second one immediately, the, the, the submission that I want to make is that the remedy that this court decides, the ICJ's position is that that remedy should fulfill the international obligation to immediately realize access to material to educational materials for people with disabilities. In dealing with the first point on the Vienna Convention and international law, just as in the papers, there's two mentions of regimes or bodies of law, and that is your copyright law being the Berne Convention and the TRIPS Agreement. And on the other hand, we have human rights law instruments such as the CRPD, the ICE, uh, SCR, and the Marrakesh Treaty. And our submission is simply that both these regimes must be considered in an attempt to create an even and harmonized interpretation of international law and the obligations that flow from it. And the source of this proposition is the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties. Now at the outset, the ICJ accepts that, the Vienna, that South Africa is not a party to the Vienna Convention, but we submit that its interpretative provisions and mechanisms fall under the banner of international customary law. And our source of or the authority for this proposition is the Law Society case in which is in footnote three of our written submissions, which deemed the main provisions to be part of customary international law. But more so in Obiter, this court held that the interpretative mechanism within the convention would also be deemed to be part of customary international law. And finally, the International Law Commission, which is cited in footnote 12 of our written submissions have also considered and agreed with this proposition as far back as 2006. And that is the interpretative provision focus on Article 313C of the Vienna Convention, which falls under the general rules of interpretation that requires, much like cool ideas, that apart from context, objectives, and purpose, in this regard, Section 313 says that any relevant rules of international law applicable in relations between parties shall be taken into account. And our submission is that this calls for a systemic integration of any relevant and applicable rules of international law. It calls for harmonization. In the South African context, we submit that it means that when considering international law, this court ought to consider international law in a manner that systemically integrates any relevant rule of international law. And so when preferring a reasonable interpretation of international law, that interpretation we submit must conform to Article 313C of the Vienna Convention. And relying on S versus Makwanyane, we submit further that this would include a consideration of both binding, the CRPD, the Berne Convention, but also non-binding sources of international law, such as the Marrakesh Treaty. It also means that copyright law cannot be read in, as an island on its own, but must be read in harmony with other relevant and applicable international human rights instruments. At that point, uh, uh, Mr. Suleiman, your protected time is up. Colleagues may now put questions to you. Please continue. As the court pleases. Just as my, the last point I made is that international law and the Vienna Convention does not permit the reading of copyright law and its regimes as an island on its own, but must be read in harmony with other relevant and applicable in international human rights instruments. And it is on this basis that the ICJ parts ways with Professor, Professor Dean's submission on interpretation. Now, I readily accept that Professor Dean in his reply accepts that international law must be interpreted as a whole. The only submission I make in this regard where the ICJ parts ways is that the effect of those submissions is that it relies on interpreting the Copyright Act as an island on its own by relying on the Berne Convention and the TRIPS Agreement without actually applying the CRPD or the ICESCR. 
or considering South Africa's obligations as a whole that flows from these conventions. And it's on that basis that we submit that insofar as the Copyright Act does not fulfill the obli international obligations set out, uh, binding obligations that are set out in the CRPD, the Copyright Act uh, be read as unconstitutional. The second leg of the argument uh, deals with that of remedy. At the high court stage, the ICJ's position was focused on section 19D. That was because that was the section was before us. And of course, as uh, proceedings have uh, rolled out, the options of remedies have expanded. But the ICJ's position is that the remedy must align itself with those international obligations. And that is providing an immediate uh, immediately accessible right to educational material. To the extent that section 19D does further South Africa's international constitutional obligations, we submit that this court may consider such a remedy. Firstly, as the CRPD and the ICESCR places a positive obligation on states to remove legislative and other barriers. My submission is all parties agree that the Copyright Act creates such barrier. But going to the first question that Justice Tehran pointed out about the definitional differences with interpretation, reproduction, etc. The only submission to that extent without going to the actual mechanics of the definition is these definitions must be read with Article 2 of the CRPD. Article 2 is the definitional clause which deals with the lights of what is communication, what is language, what is discrimination on the basis of disability and reasonable accommodation. And our submission is that either of these uh, definitions must consider that it is according to the Article 2 of the CRPD, it must be necessary and appropriate modification and adjustments to the reading material that people with disabilities would access. And those reading materials are defined under communication, which is display of text, braille, tactile communication, large print, accessible media, as well as written and audio, plain language and human reading and augmented material. And so far as crafting a remedy, considering the interpretation of uh, the act and reproduction, as well as um, adjustment, we submit that Article 2 would assist this court in plumbing a meaning of those words. And so far as Section 19D is concerned, to the extent that it removes that barrier that fulfills the immediate obligations, the ICJ submit that such a remedy may be considered. In so far as Section 19's relationship with the Marrakesh Treaty goes, we accept that the Marrakesh Treaty is a non-binding source of law. But we also submit that the Marrakesh Treaty may still be considered on the authority of S versus Makonyane, that as a non-binding source of law, the Marrakesh Treaty and the obligations that flow from it may be considered in the interpretation. We are not stating that it is binding. We are stating that it may be considered. And we say so for, three, for four reasons. The first is it's a general source of international human rights law that should be considered. In our, within our constitutional framework. We also submit that it's a relevant rule of international law in terms of the Vienna Convention. The Marrakesh Treaty itself in its preamble considers and notes conventions such as the CRPD and fulfilling the obligations that flow from it. And lastly, it's because it's a persuasive source of international human rights law that informs the contents of those binding laws such as the CRPD and the ICESCR. And by considering this treaty, we submit that as the first respondent states in its written uh, submissions, South Africa has intended to align itself with the Marrakesh Treaty. And secondly, it provides an opportunity to consider a remedy that interprets the Copyright Act as it ought to be in accordance with international law. And so Justice, in closing, <clears throat> where again we part ways with Professor Dean is that an interim provision 
uh, does not need to be drafted as closely as possible to the source of law it relies on. And we rely on the recent Zuma judgment that provides courts and the state with a degree of latitude in giving effect to international law. And to the extent that the effect of Section 19D as a remedy provides an immediately realizable right, the ICJ's submission is that such a remedy would be keeping would be in keeping with international obligations. Those are the submissions of the ICJ. Thank you, Mr. Suleiman. Um, is it uh, Ms. Goodman next? I think it, I think I am up next, Justice Madlanga. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you, Justice Malanga, Justices of the Court. Um, we would like to start with what is common ground among the parties. As Mr. Berger says, it is common cause among all of the parties here that the lacuna in the current legislative regime, that means that visually impaired people cannot currently access accessible format copies of copyrighted materials, gives rise to an egregious and sustained violation of their, their rights. We are also all in agreement that this court is squarely confronted with that violation and that it must therefore craft a remedy to it that is both effective and time bound. We do not, and I want to stress this, suggest that regulation should be left to the whim of the minister. Rather, we say that they must be directed within a time period. So the court must fashion a remedy. The remedy must be both effective and timeless. And the third point of common ground goes to a point raised by Justice Unterhalter, as we understand it, all of the parties are in agreement that an effective remedy is one that would permit South Africa to accede to Marrakesh. And the reason for that, Justices, is that it is through accession to Marrakesh that blind people will get real and tangible access to accessible format copies, which are for the most part produced elsewhere. As matters stand under 12.1a of the Copyright Act, there is a limited fair dealing provision that allows blind people to make copies for, fair, for their own personal use or for study purposes. A provision that allows only South African making of copies would expand that universe somewhat to allow domestic versions of reproductions. But it is really through the, the cross-border exchange that Marrakesh permits that, that real tangible access is enabled. And the court will know that in, in order to take advantage of Marrakesh's provisions, South Africa would need to be a contracting party and it would then deal with other contracting parties that have also exceeded. So we are in, all of the parties are in agreement is that that is the, the ultimate aim of these proceedings. And the question is the mechanism by which to do that. And on that course, Professor Dean has, makes two broad submissions. The first is to say that 19D is an inadequate provision for the purpose for which it is held up. It is not capable of bringing South Africa into alignment with 19D, and that is because it does not meet the limitations that Marrakesh imposes. And it is also not a provision that this court can read in under its, discretionary, its, reme its, its remedial discretion to read in, and that is because it goes further than the case made out for violation in this case. And I will, I will expand my submissions on both of those. So we submit that 19D cannot be the remedy that is adopted either by a reading and by this court or through the, through the regulatory making powers of the minister. Professor Dean's draft of a, of a regulation is the minimum that, that a regulation we say would need to incorporate and I'll deal with that. The second broad topic that I'm going to address is the mechanism by which the exception is incorporated into our law. And we say that the most constitutionally appropriate remedy and also the most just and equitable remedy is for this court to direct the minister to enact regulations within a specified period in order to create a regime within the least possible time that is in fact enabling for the purposes of visually impaired people. Justice McLean, if I could turn then to the first topic, it is the the mismatch between 19D and Marrakesh. Professor Dean's affidavit goes into this in, a, in, in substantial detail from pages 30 to 40 
of his intervention application, but I'd like to focus on four, on, on three areas of discord. And I want to do so with reference to the Marrakesh Treaty itself, which appears in volume one from page 59 to 69. The Marrakesh Treaty, I'm sorry, I see, the, I'm, I see justices are turning it up. That's volume one, page 59. <clears throat> Thank you. The Marrakesh Treaty as is, as is usual with treaties sets out its purposes in the preamble and the court will note that it that it so that the treaty serves two contemporaneous objectives. On the one hand, much of the preamble recognizes and gives acknowledgement to the very serious impairments and barriers that visually impaired people face in accessing copyrighted works. But it also recognizes the rights that copyright holders have and the need to protect those rights and also the integrity of the copyright regime as a whole. And I would draw the court's attention particularly to paragraph three of the preamble, where the importance of the copyright protection is emphasized. And the penultimate paragraph on the same page, which recognizes the need to maintain the balance between the effective protection of rights of others on the one hand, and the larger public interest, including facilitating access to visually impaired persons on the other. So Marrakesh recognizes that there, there are two sets of competing interests that are being balanced. And it gives effect to this balancing by introducing three limitations within its provisions that it says domestic law must incorporate. The first of those limitations relates to the purpose for which activities authorized under Marrakesh may be undertaken. And it is very clear that Authorized activities can only be undertaken for the ultimate use of blind people or visually impaired people. The court will see that in the definition of accessible format copy in Article 2B, and in the very clear limitation provisions contained in Article 42A2 and in Article 52B. All of them say that where an authorized entity makes or supplies an authorized format copy, it must have reason to believe that it is for the ultimate use of a, of a visually impaired person. And that is to prevent the dissemination of, of copyrighted works to, to non-beneficiaries under the provisions. The second limitation, Justices, relates to who may, who may invoke the provisions of Marrakesh in order to undertake authorized activities. The first category of persons is beneficiary persons and their agents who are authorized to make copies or to import copies for personal use only. And those provisions appear in Article 42B and Article 6. So a blind person can make or import for their own purposes, but as soon as importation, distribution, or making is done at scale, then it must be undertaken by an authorized entity. And an authorized entity per the definition in Article 2C must have three attributes. The one is that it must be recognized or accredited by government, designated by government. And that is to ensure that the universe of, of entities that is undertaking the copyright, the, the activities that would otherwise be precluded are recognized and controlled, so that it's a closed section of, of parties. The second limitation in the definition is that authorized entities must be entities that provide educational, training, adaptive reading, or information access services to, to beneficiary people, to visually impaired people. And the third is that they do so on a nonprofit basis. And again, the purpose of the limitation is clear. It's to ensure that an entity that gets the, that gets the benefit of the permissions under, Mar under the Marrakesh regime use it for a limited purpose rather than to create a secondary market. And the third limitation introduced by Marrakesh is the protection and safeguarding of moral rights. Moral rights, as Professor Dean explains in his affidavit in paragraph 42, are the rights of the author to be attributed and to insist that the work is not distorted to protect the integrity of the work. 
And that limitation or protection is included in Article 2B of the definition of Marrakesh, which says that an accessible format copy must maintain the integrity of the original work. So we submit that those are the, the, the minimum requirements of a domestic regime put in place in terms of Marrakesh. And their purpose is clear. They are to, on the one hand, create an enabling exception for visually impaired people who are the beneficiary class of the exception. But on the other hand, to maintain sufficient control and integrity of the, in the system to prevent abuse and to prevent the creation of a secondary market. Now, Mr. Berger for, my learned friend, Mr. Berger submits that there is no real possibility of a secondary market being created and therefore the court need not consider that. But we disagree. And I would give us the, the courts for consider, I would offer the court for consideration the example of a matric text, a matric English text uh, work, a uh, fiction work, and an audio, an audio book version of it. An audiobook version of a matric set work would be an accessible format copy for a blind student. You, you give that example, uh, the 10 minutes is up, uh, Ms. Goodman. Please Thank continue. You, Justin, no, I'll, I'll do so. So an audiobook would be an accessible format copy for the purposes of a blind student. But we know that audio, that sound recordings also have copyrights in their own right, and therefore rights that flow under them. And we know that there is a, a popular market for audiobooks, that there are many people who choose as a matter of preference and for reasons unrelated to access to listen to works of fiction rather than to read them. And so for as long as you have a large universe of works that could be accessible format copies, you have the risk of, a sec of the creation of a secondary market. And, and that, is the, that is the risk that the limitations in Marrakesh designed to guard against. Now, the point we make, Justice Midlanger Justices, is that those limitations are missing from Section 19D in the format that uh, the blind essay sought to have confirmed, but also in the portfolio committee format, which we understand blind essay now to prefer. If I could take the court to the judgment and order of the High Court, it is in volume five, page 522. I think the justices are with me, thank you. So on page 522, paragraph 10 of the High Court order, it records the reading in that was granted. The court will see that if it runs through sub one to sub four of 19D, there is no preclusion on the purpose for which the exception can be invoked. In other words, there is no requirement that the authorized activities under 19D are for the benefit, I mean, are for the use of blind people. What the court will see as sub one permits accessible format copies being made for the benefit of persons with, with a disability. But we submit that that's an insufficient limitation because you can make something with a good motive and distribute it to people who, who, who to distribute to, to a different beneficiary class. So we say, Marrakesh says you must, that authorized entities must have reason to believe that the copies that they make and distribute will go, will be, go for the use of beneficiary persons. That limitation is missing from 19D. And it remains missing from the portfolio committee version, which the court will find at page 96 of the intervention application by Professor Dean. So that's the first floor. The second floor is in subsection one. You'll recall that Marrakesh requires authorized entities to be a designated entities with particular attributes. The Copyright, the section 19D is read in says any person as may be prescribed and that serves persons with disabilities may. So there is no limitation on the kinds of entities that may be, that may be become authorized under the provision. And there is not as we see it, a clear designating process, which will mean that the minister has oversight over whom is providing those services. 
in the portfolio committee version. Sorry, Ms. Ms. Goodman, could I could I ask you this question in in con, in the context of an authorized entity? Yes. As I as I read Marrakesh, it, it would require an entity that is authorized or recognized by government. And that may speak to how NGOs require regulation and recognition in many jurisdictions other than South Africa. In, in South Africa, it may well be argued that many NGOs operate simply on the basis of being registered, but without any express authorization, because that's the nature in which civil society has flourished. And so the suggestion that the entity be authorized or recognized may be seen as, as oppressive, for example, within a South African context that may be different from other contexts. And so to, to that extent, um, is it not certainly arguable that the absence of such a requirement may well accord with a particular South African reality? Justice Kalapin, we read the requirements of an authorized and the definition of an authorized entity in 2C to treat the requirement for recognition by government on the one hand and its nonprofit basis on the other hand and the purposes and the, and the role it fulfills on the, on the third as disjunctive separate requirements. And we say that the, the recognition requirement is to ensure that government has insight into, into what entities are undertaking these exempted activities. And so our submission would be that, that your interpretation would not be a correct or Marrakesh compliant one, but we accept, we accept that that is not an issue that has been fully debated out within the legislature and that they may take a different view on that score. Yeah. May I, I ask uh, Ms. Goodman to take you to something different altogether? What, yes, would, yes. Uh, what would your interpretation of uh, translation in section one uh, A small Roman three B. What would your translation of translation be? Or what would your interpretation of translation be? Justice Midlangan, could I go back one step, which is to draw the distinction between reproduction and adaptation and then come to the why a translation as long, as long as you zoom in on the, on the interpretation of translation, because that's where my interest is. I, I, I shall do. So the distinction as a matter of copyright law, as we understand it, is that the repro reproduction is the transcription of a work into a different format, into another form, where the content remains identical. And so... And so there is no added creative input. It is the same work, but in a new form. <clears throat> the, distinction, the distinction with an adaptation between a reproduction and an adaptation is that an adaptation, the person who undertakes the adaptation adds creative input. That which they produce is different from the original in either minor respects or very major respects, but there is creative input. And therefore, it is a new work with its own copyright protection. And within those two distinctions, we say a, tra a translation is a subcategory of an adaptation. And we agree with Mr. Berger that the reason that a translation is seen as an adaptation is that when one undertakes a translation from one language to another, for example, the translator is involved in creative input of picking wording and phrasing that gives the most true effect to the original. So it is not a straight transposition of the original, it is, it is the original plus some creative nuance added. And, and, and what would your submissions be on the <clears throat> point that was raised by my sister Justice uh, Theron with Mr. Berger around translation and language. Can you translate something, or can you translate into something that is not a language? So, and also, in fact, you may even <clears throat> touch on the question whether Braille is a, a language. Your view Justice, on all of those, on all of those. Justice Mutlanga, we, we say that transcription into Braille is clearly a reproduction and not a translation or an adaptation. Okay. It takes literal content of a literary work and it changes it into a manner, into a new format that can be read by blind people. 
but the content of the work is identical. It is just in a different readable format. And we say that that same process of converting from one form to another can take place with a number of different kinds of, of works. So for example, and you'll see this in the, in the WIPO documents where they, where they go through, they provide the, sum, the overview of um, adherence to Marrakesh. They talk about the idea of transposing a Van Gogh piece into a touchable format that a blind person would be able to, to read or look at with their fingers. It would be tactile, but it is the same work because it is the work just for, for converted into another format. And on that score, the definition of reproduction is very helpful because it expressly provides that the conversion of a work from three-dimensional into two-dimensional or from two-dimensional into three-dimensional is still reproduction. It's not an adaptation. It is the same work in a different format. And building on that, Justice McLean, we say that the, that a, a permission for reproduction is wide enough to cover all of the accessible format copies that blind and visually impaired people would need to access because it permits the taking of the original work in it and the con its same content and putting it into a new format that is accessible to visually impaired people. Lastly, thank you, Ms. Goodman. Lastly, um, what's your comment on uh, the submission by Mr. Baker that uh, the only right that uh, copyright holders seek to protect is the right to be able to refuse that others do that which they, the copyright holders, aren't prepared to do anyway. What's Just your comment? Justin it, Langer, it's a, it's a longish argument and I would like to address it. The short, address it later in my submissions. The short answer is that copyright holders <coughs> have a lot of rights that attach to to their ownership of the copyright, which include the choice to decide whether or not their work will be made accessible. We accept that a constitutional interpretation of that right will mean that they couldn't, for example, withhold distribution on a discriminatory basis. May I, because you, say, because, because you say you'll address this more fully later, may I just throw in for consideration? Yes. For purposes of responding later, may I throw this in? Um, I can well imagine that uh, there may be people who will publish works for a very limited, and do so consciously, for a very limited readership, and they may, for whatever reasons, uh, not want that to go beyond uh, <clears throat> uh, that limited readership. Let's leave out for a moment uh, what issues, constitutional or otherwise, that, that may raise. But then there are also works that are published uh, for access uh, generally by any and everybody. So I, I, I would imagine that your response should touch on that as well, because uh, a, a question may well arise. Uh, if something has been published for access by any and everybody, uh, would there be a basis for wanting to limit access by uh, people who are visually impaired or print disabled? So uh, in a sense, in a sense, the point that Mr. Berger in, does in here in, the, in that sort of scenario. But as I say, if you say you're going to deal with this much Africa, you, you may do so then, you may do so then. Let me let me address your your spare proposition immediately, and then come back to the larger copyright and copyright holder issues. It is it is we submit that it is the case that a copyright the holder of a copyright would ordinarily have the entitlement to choose the circumstances in which their work is broadcast or, or published, and could among others limit. This, the, the circumstances on the basis on which it is distributed. That is one of the basket, one of the rights it has in the baskets of rights. We also accept that the effect of the copyright exception that is being created is it would remove works that had been published that are already in the public domain 
and create a limited exception that would allow blind people or authorized entities to copy them and then disseminate them. And the effect of that exception would be that the copyright holder would not be able to limit their access by blind people. That would, that would then fall into accessible copies by, by, by beneficiary persons under the exception. Um, so, so to be clear, we do, we, do not, we do not seek to assert a right on the part of copyright holders to withhold selectively from blind people or other disabled people. What we say is that the assertion that authors and copyright holders have no legitimate interest that they may want to protect when they limit, when they seek to limit the exception, say that's not correct. And again, I, I, I draw the court's attention to the audiobook. There, there are accessible format copies that have a real market, that are commercially valuable, that the owner may want to make very deliberate choices about how they make it available. And they, and they have constitutionally protected property rights in here and that, which I'm going to return to. Ms. Goodman, yes, just Mr. On, on the question of the audiobook, if a person creates an audiobook, doesn't that um, involve creative input? And wouldn't that constitute adaptation? Just, just as strong, let me say this. The, we accept Justice Collipin's proposition that sometimes the boundary between reproduction and adaptation. As I understand the position of copyright law, the creation of an audiobook which is faithful to the which is faithful to the content of the original work and does not add any dramatization would be a reproduction. A tra dramatized version of the work into audiobook is an adaptation, and that is clear from the de from the definition of an adaptation. And so, and so there may be marginal calls, but, but for the most part, an audiobook that is a is a faithful reproduction of the printed text would be a reproduction and would be permissible as an accessible format copy. What about the example that Mr. Berger referred to of a photograph? And that would that involve creative input in making that photograph accessible? Just Tron, we say not. We say that the captioning of pictures does not is, is pure description. It is a reproduction of what is happening in sound or in, or in image, and therefore is not creative input. If uh, the, the, the example that we had been discussing as a team is where you have subtitles on a movie and you have a, a caption that says person laughing or music plays. That, is, that involves no creative input at all. It is a straight caption of what is happening. And so we say that that is reproduction, not adaptation. Would you accept though that there may be instances as with the audio book where there's a fine line between the two. We, we accept that there are margin calls on both. Yes, thank you, Ms. Goodman. Uh, Ms. Goodman, may I, may I take up that point? We've, we've covered this ground before with Mr. Bergen. I'd like to hear your input on it, please. If you look at the act, the, uh, before I go to the act, I just want to remind you what you say in your heads at page 20, paragraph 50 of the written submissions. You say that simply put format shifting only entails reproduction and that and thus does not require a broader exception than that permitted by section 13. You recall that the debate is whether regulations under section 13 would be adequate. Uh, blind essay says no use and yes. Now going to the, to the definitions in the act, uh, reproduction, just to recap, specifically B says, first A says, talks about literary or musical work or a broadcast, whereas B says an artistic work includes a version produced by converting the work. Now that conversion means change. Uh, so it would, as I read it, go further than, than how we normally understand reproduction to be just uh, as you, I think you, you basically said it. It's just a, a transposition from one format to another. But that conversion is limited to artistic works, not so. And artistic works is, is uh, defined in the act um, 
as paintings, sculptures, drawings, works of architecture and works of craftsmanship and so on. So is that adequate for, for purposes of what we are dealing here? Because I think my brother Unterhalter pointed out to Mr. Berger that what we are dealing here with is uh, the visually and print disabled part of our, of our society. So it, it seems to me we're primarily dealing with literary works, not so. So is this uh, adequate reproduction? Justice Majit, as we understand the, the definition of reproduction, it gives examples under specific categories, but it has its ordinary meaning. In other words, it is reproduction in any manner or form. And so it, in, it would include, in relation to literary works, transposition of the original contact, content into Braille. Um, the, so the short answer is yes, we, we stand by the submission that it would be sufficient. I understand that there is case law on, on manner and form reproduction, and I can do no better than to refer to my client's handbook on, on the topic and on the notes on reproduction. We will, we will pull the, the section reference for you, and if I could return to that. Yes. Now, talking about your client, Professor Dean also in his book draws a clear distinction between reproduction and adaptation. And um, I think with adapt, he, he says that what you do when you adapt is you alter, you change, you modify. And what I want to take up with you is you cite again in that paragraph 50, you cite for your argument, you cite Article 4.1a of the Marrakesh Treaty, which expressly requires state parties to provide an exception to the right of reproduction, you say, but is silent on the right of adaptation. Yep. And you cite the article in footnote 70, but it's not quite correct, is it? Because Bearing in mind what we just said about adaptation and what Professor Dean says, towards the end of that, uh, of that article that you cite in footnote 70, it says the limitation or exception provided in national law, that's what the treaty says, should permit changes, modifications, in other words, alterations needed to make the work accessible in the alternative format. That seems to me to be beyond mere reproduction as, uh, as you seem to, to, to argue. <clears throat> Not so? Justice Majit, I, I think we differ on that score. The distinction between reproduction and adaptation is as a matter of copyright law, and I understand this to be the position both domestically and in foreign and international juris jurisdictions well recognized. And the dividing line we say is between the re retaining the original work or making changes to it that entail the introduction of creative input. Changes that are technical changes that in manner or form are reproduction, changes that add creative input are adaptations. And Marrakesh does not include a specific permission or anticipate that adaptations will be included in the exception. And that is because once adaptations are included, it becomes very complicated because adaptations are new works and they have their own copyright. And so, and so you would, and so it may be that you have an adaptation that is created and an adaptation then reproduction of the adaptation may itself become permissible under the under Marrakesh type regime. So what, what you're submitting is with adaptation, there will be a completely new right of copyright accruing to that new work. Is that what you're submitting? Correct, Justice Majid. And that is because the adaptation entails the introduction of creative expression in its own right. And that is what copyright is designed to protect. Yes, thank you. Uh, while I have the floor, so to speak, may, may I uh, turn to something completely different? That's remedy. Yes. Can I just get clarity as a general principle, as a general submission? You don't say that this court is absolutely precluded or even uh, that this court should be wary of um, adopting and a reading in such as a section uh, a, a legislative provision that's depending in legislation before parliament uh, as, as the as blind essay would have us do in this case. You are not saying that is, uh, there's an absolute pro prohibition against it or even a caution that it shouldn't be done. Justice Majit, we accept that the court has a power to read in even whilst the legislative process is underway. We say that the court does not have the power to read in this provision because the court has, the, the reading in power is conferred on the court in order to remedy a constitutional violation. Yes. And, that means, and that means that 
the reading in has to be a fit for the violation established. But can I just stop you there? You, everybody before this court agrees uh, that there is a constitutional violation. Yes, uh, yes. The constitutional violation that is before the court per the applicants is access for blind and visually impaired people, not for disabled people more generally. Yeah. So we See, say what, what? This, Sorry, if you just finish. I, I, I want to, uh, you can finish. Thank you. Uh, and so we say that the, the, rem, the reading in that the court must, that the court can craft is a reading in that cures that violation, the, the rights of visually impaired people. But it, that if the court were to go broader and to craft a regime that dealt with the rights of all disabled people who are not before this court, then they would be making policy choices that exceed the reading in powers of this court, which I think is a point yes. that Justice Winter Holter raised with my learning. Yes. See, in, the, in a recent judgment that uh, my brother Mlanga uh, J wrote as a majority judgment in one year versus a master. That case concerned shortfalls in the maintenance of surviving spouses act and the interstate succession act. And uh, there, this court crafted the remedy, the majority based on legislative provisions reading in, even though there was a, a domestic partnership bill pending for parliament. I must immediately add that uh, we've seen the delay in this case um, and blind essay emphasizes it. But in that case, it seems that the legislative process had stalled since 2008 for some other reason. But the point I make is this, is this, it seems to me that there's nothing that precludes us from a reading in of some other version of, of section 19D, either amplified, reduced, or explained or, or modified. Um, nothing precludes us from doing that. Do you, do you accept that? <clears throat> We accept that the court has the power to read and to cure the defect in this case, yes. And the fact it was that again, an, again, a, 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 sorry. No, no, I'm sorry. Again, just to, to refer again to a judgment of this court recently of Amabungani, which again, my brother Madlanga Jay wrote. He said there that uh, one must, when you exercise powers, when this court exercises powers, perhaps I should just bring it up, um, just bear with me. Uh, when this court exercises its powers under section 172, he says in paragraph 143 that there was criticism by the uh, uh, respondents that the uh, relief that the high court had granted there, in that case concerned RICA, as you may know, was quite extensive and it did appear to be legislative in nature. And the, the question arose whether this court should, should go that far. And uh, my brother Madlanga just said, quote, courts are required, required pursuant to declaring a legislative provision invalid to balance the obligation to provide appropriate relief with the constitutional reality of the separation of power, powers principle. Beyond that, the outer limits of a remedy are bounded only by considerations of justice and equity. This is what my brother Cameron Jay uh, described as the bogeyman. Court shouldn't allow the bogeyman of the separation of powers to to deter it from granting effective relief. My worry is that given the delays in this case that it shouldn't be left to the minister uh, where I, for me personally, it's doubtful whether he can regulate something as extensive as this under section 30, but be that as it may, why should we leave it to the minister to regulate when section 14D is before parliament and may in some or other form uh, be passed? And of course, parliament may, may change our internal reading in at any stage, if we say you have 24 months, they can do it within 12 months, they can do it within six months. So why should we leave it to the minister? Justice Majid, there are, there are a few propositions, so let me take some parts. I'm sorry, it was long-winded. Uh, uh, no, that, that's fine. I'm just, I'm ordering my thoughts if I may. We accept that the court's remedial power is wide. We, it is, how, it is however, confined to dealing with the violation before it. And it is constrained by the old principle that, um, that the court mustn't engage in legislation making or policy choices. We would refer the court to the to paragraph 95 of ITAC, that's ITAC versus SCORE 2012-4618, where the court says, where the constitution or valid legislation has entrusted specific powers and functions to a particular branch of government, courts may not usurp that power function by making a decision of their preference. 
that which frustrates the balance of power implied in the, separation of, the principle of separation of powers. The primary responsibility of the court is not to make decisions reserved for within the domain of other branches of government, but rather to ensure that the, that the concerned branches of government exercise their authority within the bounds of the constitution. This would be especially so where the decision is policy laden as well as policy centric. Now, in this situation, we say there is an express power on the minister to adopt regulations. We say in the context of this case, he is obliged to make those regulations because the, everyone accepts that some kind of exception is required in order to bring the copyright regime into constitutional compliance. And the minister is of course obliged to take steps to protect, promote and fulfill the rights in the Bill of Rights. And he has conferred the power under section 39 and 13 of the Copyright Act to make regs where they are required. So we say he has not just a power, but a power and a duty to make the exception in this case. And the benefit of allowing him to do so rather than this court is that he has the ability to make nuanced choices about the category of disabled people who can be benefited under the regime, the categories of works that can be, that can be made available under the regime, and to deal with the nuances that those, those differences will imply. Now, I want to be very clear, Justice Majid, Professor Dean and we accept that South Africa can go broader, can make a more permissive regime than Marrakesh. But we would stress this, it is the legislature that can do that. It is not the court. Because to do so, to make a choice for a broader legislative regime is a policy choice and it is beyond the remit of this court. And one of the reasons we say it is preferable to remit the matter back to the minister is so that he can make that more permissive regime rather than the constrained power of this court to craft the more limited regime that it can be constrained to do. The danger as we see at Justice Majid in this court enacting a, a broader regime is this. If it were the minister by regulation or parliament and legislation that decides to enact a broad permissive regime, a regime that makes greater incursions into the rights of copyright holders than Marrakesh, then you would have on the one hand, the rights of disabled people that would have to be balanced against the rights of property owners because we submit, and I can go into this, I, I think it is no longer in dispute that intellectual property is pro constitutionally protected property. But when a copyright holder is divested of certain aspects of their copyright entitlements, that we say is a deprivation of property under section 25. And the question of whether or not that deprivation is constitutionally permissible will, determine on, will turn on a proportionality analysis, whether on the one hand, the rights that the copyright holder is divested of are justified by the rights invoked by the party on the other side on the other. So you have this balancing exercise that has to be undertaken. Parliament can undertake that balancing exercise and so can the minister. Now assume Justice Majit that, Parliament, that the minister adopts a set of regulations that are very permissive and strip copyright holders of a broad range of entitlements. What would then happen is that the copyright holder would have the opportunity to go to court and challenge that regulatory regime. The problem where that regime is read in by this court is that there is not an equivalent power, entitlement on the part of a copyright holder to bring that challenge. Because we know from this court's very recent jurisprudence that the ability of a litigant to second guess and revisit a, an order granted by this court is very limited. And so the risk, of a, the risk that this court must bear in mind with respect in crafting a broader remedy is that it may have the unintended consequence of chilling future litigation and limiting a, a copyright holder's right, legitimate right of access to court. So we say, sorry, to sum up, we say there are two reasons why the court is constrained to adopt the narrow remedy. It is the separation of powers concern, but also the risk of chilling litigation. We say it is also preferable that the minister have that power because the minister is the correct functionary, is also an appropriate functionary to decide the basis on which and the method through which the, the South Africa will accede to an international instrument. And it is a, the just and actual functionary because he can craft a better, more inclusive regime and a regime that is amenable to change in a much easier way than legislation. 
But we, we are constrained to accept Justice Majid that it cannot be that the, that the minister, that this is left to language. We, we align ourselves with blind essay that there must be an immediate, an immediate solution to, this, to, to the predicament that blind people face. And so if it is going to be remitted to the minister for enactment of regulations, we submit that this court must put the minister on terms to do that. Yes, and if I could, you. thank you, sorry, and just to tag on my, la the, my last related point in this regard, we say that we would draw the courts, we say that the court unequivocally has the power to direct the minister to, to make regulations. This court has repeatedly um, directed members of the executive to take steps so on the one hand and in Kruger's case, the president was directed to publish proclamations. In New Clicks, the uh, regulations were referred back for reconsideration and direction that they were published. And we would merely add two cases that are not in our heads of argument. The one is the case of Ali versus Minister of, sorry, Minister of Home Affairs versus Ali. It is a judgment of Justice Motoko and SCA. The citation is 2019-2SA396-SCA. And that is an instance of the SCA ordering the Department of Home Affairs to adopt regulation, to enact regulations within a specified period. And uh, your, your time is up, Ms. Goodman. Uh, how much more time do you want? Justice Midlanger, may I, may I give a, the citation to another case very quickly and then make an assessment, have a quick look at my notes to make assessment of that. The second case on regulation making that I, is a case, the trustees for the time being of Groundwork Trust versus the Minister of Environmental Affairs. It is a very recent judgment of the High Court, also ordering the adoption of regulations. We would beg leave to make that available to the court after the hearing, Justice Midlanger. And then, um, time? Time. May I have one moment just to see where, where I am? Justice McLanger, I would say that I need about another five to 10 minutes, if that is okay. I give you five only, and uh, that's the terminal point. Deal. Um, thank you, Justice McLanger. Ms. So Goodman, I'm, I'm sorry, and I won't uh, intrude upon your time, which has just been given to you, but well, can I I'll just start, take you back? I'll start, I'll start, I'll start counting the, the five minutes uh, after you've responded to the question by my brother, Justice Mendoza. Thank you, Justice Mendoza. Can I just take you back uh, briefly to the uh, reproduction adaptation debate? Yes. One of the things that Mr. Berger said was that uh, graphs and tables and perhaps technical publications, which are not just uh, text in the ordinary way, may well require uh, a form of adaptation. And one of the features of the papers before us is that we don't have much um, technical scientific um, assistance as to what technologies are required in respect of making um, formats available for blind or visually impaired people. But I'm just wondering, firstly, whether uh, even on an expanded view of reproduction, one would be able, as it were, to describe a histogram in a scientific textbook and say, no, that's just reproduction because it, it's simply trying to render in, in words what is depicted in a figure. Justice Unterhalter, I must confess to being, to having the same difficulty that you do. I, it is difficult to know what the limits of, where the limits of reproduction lie and what it would leave out of the reckoning because Blind Essay has not told us what, what is not included. Yes. Our and position remains that, that where, where you have a graphical or image representation, the reduction of that into a, a word-based description would be a reproduction because it, is, it, is, it lacks creative input. But I can yes. tell you. Uh, assuming there are at least some borderline cases which might uh, shade into adaptation, uh, since we're concerned with the constitutionality of the Copyright Act, is there 
a, a way of looking at this problem, which says, well, we should expand the competence under Section 13 to allow for regulations which would permit of such format shifting that would allow visually impaired persons to have access to uh, literary works. Justice Untold, could I say that it's not clear to me that that would be necessary because there are already fair dealing provisions under the Copyright Act that would be read together with the reproduction exception and uh, that the reproduction uh, exception in section 13. So for example, 12.1a permits of fair dealing um, for the purposes of research or private study or the personal private use of a person dealing with the work. It permits the, for the purposes of reporting of current events, it permits of quotations of sections of work. And it may be that, that those provisions would enable limited limited incursions into the ordinary copyright regime that would adequately facilitate the needs of the night. Let's of assume that we still have anxieties, notwithstanding the fair dealing provisions. It yep. is, is a possible remedy here to, as it were, say that 13 is too restrictive as to the exceptions that it permits in this particular case. Uh, or is that uh, a remedy that is uh, uh, beyond our powers? In other words, to say the, the unconstitutionality is that the special exception did, didn't go far enough to allow for um, the, the kind of accessible formats that visually impaired power people require. Justice Untalter, the court obviously has the very broad power to the very broad power to craft any remedy that it thinks is fit for purpose of the violation before it. And so at the level of principle, I would say that yes, it has that, yeah. it has that power. My slight anxiety is, is around the fact that there has not been an opportunity for parties to weigh in on, on that power. And so it may be that there would need to be a, an opportunity for further directions if that was the way that the court was inclined. But that, that to my mind is the only impediment to that kind of thing. Thank you. And then just lastly, and I'm afraid I'm dotting around a little bit, but just to go back to an argument you were developing about uh, how 19D um, would make um, ratification of Marrakesh problematic. We've heard a lot of submissions from a number of parties before us, which says that you can't only look uh, at Marrakesh or indeed the Berne Convention and TRIPS because there are many other human rights uh, conventions that we are party to. Now, the simple case is to go further than Marrakesh, but still be consistent with Marrakesh. But a great deal of what has been put to us is to say that we should go further than Marrakesh, but you're saying further may also mean inconsistent with Marrakesh. Could you just assist us as to how, if we are to fashion a remedy along the lines of 19D, we can show fidelity to all South Africa's international law obligations whilst not impeding the possibility of ratification of Marrakesh? Thank you, Justice Santolta. Yes, the the three minimum thresholds we say 19D would have to include is one, the limitation on the, on the use for which, the, the purpose for which the copy is made or distributed. So that is the exclusion to ensure that it is only for the use of beneficiaries. The second is to, is the debate around authorized entities. We say to be Marrakesh consistent, it would require a designation system, which the current regulation does, but in a watered down version, and also a limitation of what kind of entities can procure designation. And the third, the third we say is that the protection of moral rights. And there we would draw the court's attention to subsection four of the reading in order, which allows which allows an incursion into the moral rights insofar as it requires attribution of the author only where practical. We say that that is a non-delegable non right, non-derogable right. There must always be attribution of, of the author because moral rights cannot be 
interfered with. So those are the, those are the minimum requirements. In addition, Justice Unterhalter, we say that 19D is flawed because it excludes some of the Marrakesh, some of the permissions that Marrakesh is, intends to include. And the two important ones here are firstly, it does not make provision for blind people or their agents, visually impaired people or their agents, to make, make or import personal use copies. Um, and this, this is a technical point, but it's one of some importance. Sorry, I've switched my view. Sorry, go back. Um, if I could take the court very briefly to sub one of the High Court's order, uh, the court will see that, sorry, sub two of the High Court's order says that a person with a disability or a person that serves persons with disabilities to whom the work is communicated may, without the authorization of the owner of the copyright, re um, sorry, means as a, sorry, who's, let me start again. A person with a disability or a person who serves them to whom a work is communicated by wire or wireless means as a result of an activity under subsection one may, without the authorization of the owner of the copyright work, reproduce for personal use. So the permission that 19D says is it says, if you get an accessible format copy from an authorized entity, you as a blind person may make a copy. But that's an unhelpful provision, Justice Unterhalter. What, what, a, what Marrakesh envisages is that blind people or agents will themselves be able to get the original and make their own copy as, as we understand Justice Yacoub approved it. So that's missing from 19D. The other permission that is missing from 19D is that it does not provide for authorized entities to supply accessible format copies between one another. And this is a really important exclusion because it is the exchange of accessible format copies between authorized entities in different countries that, in, in, that enables cross-border exchange. So those are the provisions that, that we say are missing. We also point out, it's a, a point raised in the, in the papers at some length, that 19D doesn't read in its definitions. And so no. we say that those would also be required. And if I could commend the court's attention to Professor Dean's draft of the regulation, and I will be very, very brief in the score. It appears at page 50 of the intervention application. And we say that this is a good model for the courts for the, for the court to adopt, even if it doesn't adhere to his exact wording. Subsection one of his draft regulation contains the, the um, definitions and they closely adhere to the terms of Marrakesh. We point out in particular that subsection D gives the definition of works and it is wider than just literary works because Marrakesh also includes permissions wider than just literary works. And we understand it would include a broad universe of works and also enable digital, digital access as Media Monitoring Africa um, highlights. Subsection two is the permission on authorized entities to make or to supply, including to one another. And importantly, over the page, it includes the limitation in A, that they had lawful access to the work themselves, and in, in C, that they provide or undertake the authorized activity exclusively for the, for the ultimate use of beneficiary persons. So that we say is an essential protection. Um, paragraph three in, allows for cross-border exchange. Paragraphs four and five are the personal use exceptions that enable a blind, per, a visually impaired person or their agent to make or import copies of personal use. And paragraph six is the, is the moral right protection. So, that we say is the format broadly that must be followed. We, and we say the, the minimum core is the, is the three limitations, but we stand by the submission that the thing that the court cannot do is it cannot create a broader, vision, a broader beneficiary class than the, than the class on whose behalf these proceedings are brought. In other words, blind, visually impaired and print disabled people. And that is because there are very complicated considerations that arise when one considers, for example, cognitively impaired people who need simple textbooks. If yes. there's still an like answer to the question, I was going to say that's a very long one. <laughs> My brother, are you still continuing? I'm, uh, I'm, 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 I'm done. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you Just very much. Long, it, it, was a, it was a long answer, but 
you'll be relieved to hear that it covers most of the remainder of my, my argument. If I may just have a moment to check with my junior on, on what we have remained. Thank you, Ms. Good. Thank you. Justice Midlang, I have, I, I need another two minutes. The one is to provide the reference to Justice Majit that we promised to Professor Dean's handbook. It is section 8-4 on page 168A that deals with reproduction and the various forms it can take. The other is to, to provide a brief, brief summation of where we've landed. So we submit and we stand by the, the position that the appropriate mechanism here is to order the adoption of regulations. We say that section 13 is a limited power conferred on the minister that contains its own confined preconditions. And if the court looks at that, the limitations in section 13 are broad, broadly in line with the three-step test. They say the minister can make regulations that are not in conflict with the normal exploitation and that are not unduly prejudicial to copyright holders. That those limitations are all of the limitations entailed in section 13. And so there is no preclusion or unconstitutionality entailed in making regulations under that provision. And we would highlight to the court the breadth of exceptions that have already been created. So for libraries, archives, teachers, and classroom settings. The regulations and that have been given effect to under section 13 enact broad permissions. Section 13 has never been challenged in a response and neither of those regulations. And so we su submit that the, that the suggestion that section 13 is an inappropriate delegation of a plenary power is, is incorrect. The, Adoption of regulations is also the most appropriate mechanism by which to, to give effect to this change because of the broad powers that the minister has in contradistinction to this court. But if the court is nevertheless inclined to adopt a reading in rather than, rather than directing the enactment of regulations, then we would commend its attention to the, to the draft of Professor Dean rather than section 19D. And we submit that that is particularly in the yes. case. Last, last sentence. I this is the terminal point, uh, Ms. Goodman. And we note only Justice Midlanger that 19D is no longer championed as strongly as it was by, by blind essay and in those circumstances must, must be departed from by this court. Those are our submissions, Justice Midlanger. I appreciate the patience. Thank you, Ms. Goodman. Um, Ms. Raja Patlenda. Thank you, Justice Madlanga. Um, Justice Madlanga, we have listened with great interest to the um, debates before the court today. Um, the aim of government throughout this process, uh, notwithstanding the fact that it has taken a long time and, is, and continues to do so to achieve this aim, is in recognition of the fact that the rights of persons with print and visual disabilities are not provided for in the Copyright Act. Um, and because not only should the act provide mechanisms to enable uh, print disabled persons to have access on a more equal basis to accessible format copies of literary and artistic works as the Marrakesh Treaty provides, but importantly, um, because the rights of all disabled persons must be protected and facilitated by amendment, amendments to this act. Um, and so the court will notice that our position in, in this litigation has been to accept or has been premised on the fact that immediate relief is provided on an interim basis for blind and visually impaired persons while parliament engages on how best to amend the Copyright Act. Not simply to give effect to the, those rights, but more broadly to meet all of government's um, constitutional and legislative obligations. 
So for the minister, it's not simply about acceding to the Marrakesh Treaty, which we believe should happen through uh, national legislation, um, uh, but it is uh, more broadly to give relief to the applicants in this court that we, uh, that we participate in these proceedings in the way we do. Um, if one looks at the, so bearing in mind, let me, let me say this, bearing in mind the nature of the debate this morning, I think I should deal very briefly with the following issues. The, the first is the broad policy approach of government that is reflected uh, not just in 19D, but more broadly in the amendment bills. Um, the second is whether the minister may make regulations as contemplated by the first amicus and why he has not done so. Uh, and the third is, is to look at a remedy and whether 19D meets the case before this court. So if I may then turn to the first issue, the broad policy approach. Although the process of amending the Copyright Act uh, has been, as I say, an extended and protracted one, which we acknowledge, the fact of the proposed amendment remains important. Also important is government's clear and stated aim of amending, it, of amending the Copyright Act to bring South Africa in line with all of its international obligations, not simply the Marrakesh Treaty. Um, and those, those obligations are not uh, uh, before this court in any full or complete manner. In addition, government's approach throughout the parliamentary, or throughout the proceedings amending the act has been focused on attempting to balance competing interests. Um, the interests on the one hand of the rights of authors of works, with the rights of disabled persons to address discriminatory aspects of the act are one aspect of the issues that government has to deal with. Um, government is also, in, as one will see in, in the record, has spent considerable time considering submissions around um, counterfeit, uh, for example, uh, improper use of, 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 of works. And so there are, various, uh, and, um, there are various issues that need to be considered and they are highly technical. 19D was introduced um, not simply to accede to Marrakesh, because there are other provisions that assist um, Parliament in doing so, but, but to, as I say, give, right, give effect to the rights of, of disabled persons. And that's why it is so broad. It does go broader than Marrakesh. Uh, and, it, and there doesn't seem to be any dispute among my colleagues today that that is permissible, that, uh, that Marrakesh, as my colleague Mr. Berger said, is the floor, not the ceiling. Now, if one wants regard, I'm not going to take the court through it just in the interest of the limited time that I've been given, but I will just refer the court to volume two of the record um, from pages 109 onwards, which provides some high level um, um, information about the process that has been dealt with um, leading up to 19D. Um, for the purposes of the court, what, what's clear from that process is that it is a technical um, and extremely complicated process that warranted multiple uh, submissions from various uh, sectors of the industry um, and, and required technical advice to be taken also by government. And whatever remedy this court ultimately crafts, we would ask that the court bears that in mind. Um, now, in relation to where the process before Parliament stands at present. Wait. I'm sorry to stop your mid sentence, Ms. Raja, but Linda, the five minutes is up. But Thank you, Justice Madlang. Continue. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I was, uh, Mr. Berger was asked about where the process currently stands um, in, before Parliament. Uh, I understood him to be largely uh, correct, uh, according to my instructions anyway in that the process has not yet been submitted or the bills have not yet been submitted to the National Assembly. Um, but where we differ is that he said that there was, there was, I think he said virtually no way in which 24 months was a sufficient period of time for this process to be completed. My instructions are that that is, not, that is certainly not clear um, and that it may indeed um, all be concluded uh, long before the 24 months. The reason I'm instructed for that is because the National Assembly has already considered this bill in a not entirely dissimilar fashion. Um, and so it's anticipated that that process won't necessarily take as long as the process before the National Council of Provinces. Of course, um, one knows that these things are hard to predict. 
um, and that elections and other things happen that slow parliamentary processes down. So I, I simply say that it's, it's not clear is the bottom line. Um, Ms. Ms. Rajab Badlender, can I just go back to, to, to a question that was posed by my brother, uh, Justice Majid, uh, to Ms. Goodman, because my anxiety is uh, it concerns the same the same issue. It, 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 it's regard to the proposal made by Professor Dean uh, about the regulations that instead the answer to this lies into the enactment of the regulations. And I'm asking you as a representative of the minister, um, it concerns the ability of the minister to enact regulations within the time periods that would be set out by this court and the process that did, the, that, that process would take. And my, my, my anxiety arises and I, I want to talk on behalf of my brother Majid is, is, is that we know that in the enactment of, 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 of 19D, there were delays and I was wondering whether the minister would then be able to enact regulations uh, within the time period that would be set by the court or would have a situation where the minister comes back to this court and asks for an extension. The reason why it concerns, that concerns me is whether we would actually not be, if we, if we, if we went the, the section 13 route, creating a parallel process that will, uh, have the same or similar challenges or similar delays as the Section 19D process. Yes, um, thank you, Justice Cheeky. I think um, it, it, the question raised is a very important one. In my, in my limited experience, this court often gives a minister, um, or gives parliament a period of time to change uh, amend legislation. In other matters where we've had to consider the making of regulations, we, I say we as in um, my experience simply at the bar, is that a period of 12 months appears to generally be a period that is afforded to a minister to make regulations. Now, of course, the process of making regulations is a much more attenuated one than, than amending legislation. Uh, and, and as we've seen during the period of um, um, National disaster regulations can be made where appropriate in a much shorter period of time. So it, it's, it is a difficult question for me to answer. What, what I do want to point out is the following, that simply um, reading in uh, 19D doesn't, uh, doesn't avoid the need for regulations because 19D is the high court read it in, which you will find um, at page 522 on um, volume five is requires, it talks about a person as may be, be prescribed. So my, my colleagues dealt with this earlier this morning. It, it does require that the minister will have to decide who is prescribed unless this court reads in a version of 19D that removes those words um, and, and is more specific about who that person contemplated in, 19, in 19D1 is. Um, so, so the need to make regulation is not avoided entirely by simply reading in 19D. That, that's the first point. But if I may take a step back, I think it's important for this court to have an answer from the minister as to why the minister didn't make regulations in, in this case. Um, and firstly, let me say, apologize to the court for not having put in supplementary submissions on this point. Um, the, the, the short answer is that we did not receive the submissions in time for me to consult and do that. And that is a difficulty related to um, administrative issues with the state attorney. But having said that, I have been able to consult with my client yesterday afternoon. Um, and what my, and these are my instructions. The minister's positions on the making of regulations are as follows. The, the making of regulations as a possibility um, was raised during the public participation process. I think, in fact, it was raised by Professor Dean. Um, and there were various stakeholders that objected to the regulations being an appropriate mechanism 
of, of dealing with the rights of print disabled uh, persons and of bringing the Marrakesh Treaty um, into the forefront and uh, acceding to the Marrakesh Treaty, I should say. Um, the minister's view was, having considered those objections, that if he made regulations on print disabled persons, affecting print disabled persons, those regulations would likely have been declared ultra vires because the act itself, in his view, doesn't deal with the rights of, of any disabled persons at all, let alone blinded and visually um, disabled persons. So for the regulations to be meaningful, um, they would have required quite extensive definitions, for example, that are not in the act, um, and also effectively be regulating something that's not in the act. Um, so you would have to accept then, in order to do that, that, that Section 13 of the Act is very broad and is appropriately broad. Um, and the Minister's advice uh, and, and his view based on that advice was that those regulations would be ultra vires. Um, if one considers, and in support of that view, if one considers the structure of the Act, there are very intentional exceptions created in the body of the Act already. And one will see that from sections 12 to um, 19, where the Act deals with various very specific exceptions. For example, fair dealing with literary and musical works um, for private use, um, that's section 12. Section 14 deals with exemptions in respect of records and musical works. Um, 15 deals with protection of artistic works, et cetera. Um, and, and, and we submit what this shows is that it is, it is certainly not clear that the minister is entitled to make regulations under section 13 for print uh, disabled persons. Um, that's on, on the one hand. On, this, on the other hand, we, not on the other hand, but as a second point in support of this, um, the minister's view is that in order to see to Marrakesh, um, South Africa must pass national legislation that contains exemption, exceptions as contemplated in the treaty. Um, and, and to do so by way of regulation would be um, inappropriate. We do not accept that there was a, a duty or an obligation on the minister to make regulations to give effect to these rights as, as um, the first amicus has contended. Um, instead, we think that there is a duty on parliament to ensure that the act is not discriminatory and that through national legislation, they, it, South Africa can accede to the treaty. Now, whether that's correct um, as a matter of law uh, is a question of law. Um, and this court will guide the minister in that. I simply give you that background so you are uh, in a position um, to understand why the minister chose not to make the regulations. And of course, my instructions are that if this court considers that regulations are the appropriate um, tool to be used as a remedy in this case, that, that the minister will, of course, comply. Um, I do also point out that, that an order directing the minister to make regulations, it would be somewhat unusual. Um, Ms. Goodman has pointed to the two cases I wanted to take the court to, which are the only two cases I can think of where the court has, has directed a minister to make regulations, and those were the case of Minister of Home Affairs versus Ali, um, of the, which is a 2018 decision of the SCA, and the second very recent unreported judgment of the Groundwork Trust versus Minister of Environmental Affairs, which is a high court decision. Um, but in those cases, what we saw was, and, and certainly in the Groundwork Trust case, what's absolutely clear is that the direction to the minister was based on an acceptance of a finding by the court that the minister had a statutory duty to make regulations. Um, and that that based on that duty, the, the direction flowed. Um, I, I think that that case may be on appeal or about to be on appeal to this court, and I just bring that to your attention for the sake of completeness. The point is that it is, it is, it is unusual to make an order directing the minister to make regulations. Um, and to do so, I would suggest that if this court considers that there is a constitutional or statutory duty on the minister to make regulations, then the court could, could um, grant an endowment directing the minister to carry out those duties. Um, so you wouldn't tell the minister specifically what to include in the regulations, but you would ask the minister to consider a series of issues in doing so. Um, ultimately, of course, whether those regulations themselves meet uh, the constitutional requirements is a question that would, would stand over um, once those regulations are made. 
So on the whole, to, to answer Justice Chiki's uh, question, the minister's view, having considered all the submissions, was that amending the legislation was a more appropriate way forward. Um, and, and that would allow government to meet all of its legal and constitutional obligations and international obligations. Um, if I may then turn to the next um, issue that I'd like to deal with, which is the question of section 19D. I've, I've alluded to some of the issues already, so I, I try not to repeat myself. Um, the minister's position in this court is that if this court finds that, that the act is unconstitutional, then it would be appropriate to read in section 19D on an interim basis. Um, and importantly, we note that 19D is not perfect. Um, the applicants suggest that, that, it's, that it is not contested. It's not quite true. We say in our heads that there are concerns that have been raised about whether the section sufficiently and appropriately defines certain terms. And those terms go to the heart of facilitating access to print materials. Um, so some of those terms, for example, are about um, accessible format copy um, and beneficiary, for example. Those are some of the terms that Parliament is grappling with introducing at the moment. So 19D is, is certainly not perfect. Um, and um, based on the submissions made to Parliament, it, it may well change. Before Can I ask you, Ms. Raja Badland, are those concerns that you allude to in your submissions and now again in your written submissions, those concerns can conceivably be addressed if this court uh, endorses the High Court's approach of uh, reading in something uh, along the lines of Section 19 deeds can certainly be addressed by this court's wide remedial discretion in Section 172 by, for example, including uh, definitions of accessible format copy, uh, beneficiary, and so on. Not so? Yes, Justice Najib, that, that, that is correct. Um, and what we would say is that if this court adopts that sort of a reading in that, in addition, this court should consider including the two definitions specifically in Section 1A and 1H. Um, to, to, to make sure that 19D is workable uh, yes. and makes sense. And also, yes, comp uh, and also complies with Marrakesh, uh, fits in with Marrakesh, yes. Indeed. Now, now, Indeed. now the other thing is you've mentioned the concerns around the, the minister around the legality, the, the Vire's point uh, about making regulations. Th that is the larger picture, but my my concern zooms in on 13 specifically. As I read 13, and this has been canvassed with some of, some of your colleagues, is that it appears to be limited to reproductions. And as I see it, what, what would be required uh, is more than simple reproduction. It's, it seems to me that it's something more along the lines of adaptations and there's the question of cross-border uh, exchanges, there's the question of importation and exportation. Um, what is your view on Section 13's reach at its ambit in terms of making regulations for this particular uh, aspect that is now before us? Yes, Justice Majid, I, I would agree um, and that, that 13 is more limited than it initially appears. So I, I think you're correct that, in fact, if I look at the text of, of the provision, it, it, it does appear to be uh, in addition to reproductions permitted in terms of this act reproduction of a work shall also be permitted as prescribed by registration, by regulation. Um, and so it does focus itself on reproductions. Um, one of my concerns with um, almost cutting and pasting this proposed regulation in, in as a remedy is that there are very technical terms that the act contains that this court is going to be required to to weigh in on and to come to a view on. In the absence of evidence before this court about what those terms mean and how they're used. So we don't know, for example, uh, what accessible format copies are in relation to uh, reproduction um, when you're considering the rights of print disabled persons. We don't have that before. This court doesn't have it before. It. Um, and, and that's certainly something that I think would uh, suggest that the court should be cautious about uh, simply reading in um, the regulations as, as the amicus um, suggests. Um, 19D, we do know, although it's not perfect, we do know that it is something that has, that reflects government policy that is in the current bill that's, that's going through a parliamentary process. And so in some respects with suitable amendments, it is um, possibly more appropriate. Um, we, uh, 
Thank you. We are one minute beyond uh, um, for the, uh, your, your time, the 20 minutes. Um, how much more time do you want? Um, Not much longer, uh, Justice Madlanga. I'm just having a quick look at my notes to see. Um, if I could just point out, I may have misunderstood Ms. Goodman, but she referred to the fact that if one didn't have these regulations, um, you wouldn't be able to have personal use as an exception. Um, I didn't understand that to be the case. If one looks at Section 12 of the Copyright Act, um, personal use appears to be provided for. Uh, in section 12. So I don't think that reading in 19D means that you will, um, you will necessarily not have a protection for personal use, because of course, if you read in 19D, you still have the rest of the act uh, in existence. 19D doesn't operate in isolation. So I just want to point that to the court. Um, and then finally, in, in one minute. One minute, uh, all right, thank you. In, in one minute, simply to say that um, we've placed in our heads of argument why we think an interim reading in is more appropriate to a final reading in as the applicant uh, asks. Um, it may be that nothing um, too much turns on it. It's simply that it has, it is the practice of this court to, to utilize the method of an interim reading in um, because this court has always said that reading in is, must be done with some level of caution. Um, and I've referred in my heads to all of the cases there. Um, and, and an interim relief, interim reading in provides immediate relief to the applicants. Should Parliament not pass the Act in, a, in the 24-month period, then the interim reading will become final. So, so we'd submit there's no prejudice involved. Um, Justice Madlanga. Madlanga, I'm sorry I, uh, to intrude upon your last uh, 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 passage of time, but can I just put one, uh, one, one, one issue to you? You've raised uh, some cautionary words about uh, about using uh, regulations that Professor Dean has proposed uh, and saying there are powers that might exist under Section 13. What do you say about the powers that we have as a court, uh, even by way of an interim reading in, to adopt 19D, which clearly goes wider and further than the case that is made out before us. How are we in a position to adopt a, a legislative provision, which not only deals with disabled people generally, but is also intended to serve wider policy concerns that go way beyond the case that has been made out before us? Well, where do we derive that power? Yes. Thank you, Justice Antalta. That is something that concerns me. Um, and I went back to look at the founding affidavit when you first raised this question with my colleague, Mr. Berger. It, it does appear that, that when you look at the founding affidavit, that the case that's brought um, to court is really one about vindicating the rights um, of blind and visually impaired persons in terms of the discriminatory effect, or in the context of the discriminatory effect of the act. They do, however, refer to the Marrakesh Treaty. And they, they, so they, they don't do it um, in the way that perhaps it ought to have been done to meet the relief that they now seek. Um, and so I, I, I would say- Mr. But Mr. Berger, I'm sorry to interrupt, but Mr. Berger has expressly disavowed a case saying, that his cause of action is predicated on the failure to take legislative steps that would permit of accession to Marrakesh. He says, that's not my case. Mm. If, so if, uh, we have to live with the case he's pleaded. Uh, we, we can't invent a case to create a remedy which isn't founded on the cause of action, which is the, the point I'd made to him. Yes, no, precisely. I, I, I have to agree with that, Justice Undalta, and I think the remedy must then meet the case that is brought to court. And, and that is why our concern is really, in this case, the rights of uh, uh, the discriminatory effect of the Act, not the Marrakesh Treaty. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Justice Madlanga. Justice Madlanga, uh, unless there are any further questions, I think I've sped through um, my, my uh, submissions, and I hope that I've answered um, any concerns of the court. But if there aren't any questions, those are my submissions. Oh, one last thing. Um, we, we did um, uh, say that if we are unsuccessful, that we shouldn't have costs awarded against us. We understand that is quite a, um, an unusual thing for a minister to say before this court. Um, since then, we have had occasion to look at the Levenstein decision, and we've considered that the nature of the debate has changed with the introduction of the regulation uh, argument based by the amici. So we don't, we, we don't proceed with that argument in it, uh, any longer.
Thank, thank you. I'm not. I'm not sure that you would have been on firm ground uh, even <laughs> what, <laughs> without uh, what you are referring to. Thanks, Mr. Uh, Raja Badlander. Thank you. Yes, thank you, yes, yes, Mr. Baker. Thank you, Justice Madlanga. Um, Justice Madlanga, I, notwithstanding your comment about replies often being nothing more than cold potatoes, I. I will attempt just to deal with a, a number of issues, but deal with them very briefly. What happens? Um, what happens when I meet council in uh, uh, in chambers uh, stays there, Mr. Berger. <laughs> continue, please continue. My apologies. My apologies. Uh, the the first point I wish to make is that if this court were to go the route, the Section Thirteen route, and to to order the the minister to make regulations and provide a time frame within which to do it. Um, we would submit that that time frame needs to be as short as is reasonably possible. And coupled with that is that if there is non-compliance, there needs to be some kind of consequence for non-compliance. So if it's a, a three month or six month time period within which to make regulations, we would submit that, that a just and equitable remedy in such circumstances would be to say, if such regulations are not in force within whatever the time period is, in that case, then there will be a reading in of, of section 19D or some kind of form, form of 19D. And this is very similar to, to what the court did in the Fourier case, where, where the definition of the common law or definition of marriage, or, um, the declaration of invalidity was suspended for a two-year period. Parliament was given an op opportunity to decide which policy choice it which to en enact. And if it failed, which it didn't, um, then the remedy of, of a reading in to the Marriage Act would have come into force. So we say, if, if that's the route you go, we, we don't, we would not li like you to go that route, but if that's the route you go, then there must be some consequence for, for non-compliance. The second is the, the issue of the definition of authorized entity in, in Marrakesh. Um, I, I don't want to go through the, the definition in the, the treaty in, at all, but just to point you to, to make two points. The first is that what the definition in our reading um, contemplates is that there are certain categories of, of entities that are deemed to be authorized and would not require any particular process of authorization. And that's the, the last sentence where it talks about, it also includes a government institution or nonprofit organization that provides the same services to beneficiary persons as one, as one of its primary activities or institutional obligations. And we say that that doesn't need any process of express authorization to allow for an organization such as the applicant to perform that function. And the footnote to, to that definition, footnote two, um, we say supports that interpretation. The Third point is a point that Ms. Goodman raised about the requirement that the Section 19D is not lim does not have an, a requirement that it should only be for the use of, of blind people. Um, we submit that we, we would have no problem whatsoever if 19D were to be read in, and instead of the phrase person with disability, what was read in was beneficiary person, uh, whether that comes with a definition that the Marrakesh definition directly or with the reference to the Marrakesh definition in the judgment. Um, we, we said it doesn't matter, but quite happy, given that this case was brought on behalf of beneficiary persons for the relief to be limited to, to beneficiary persons. The issue of audiobooks, I have two points to, to make on that. The first is that if audiobooks are available on the market, then once they are available, Section 19D or any provision like it would not kick in. 19D only kicks in in circumstances where there is no accessible format of a particular published work. If a work is published in, as an audio book, then copyright rests in it, and then Section 19D wouldn't kick in because it would, it would be purchasable on, and, and available on the market. Linked, linked to that is the, the point that was made in relation to the what happens if does copyright vest in an accessible format copy in the form of an audiobook that is made, we submit that any accessible format copy that is made would not necessarily give, would not give rise to additional rights. 
the rights that it gives rise to would be those as limited in section 19D. You once, as the author of that accessible format copy, you would not be able to do more than 19D permits you to do. I just have a handful left of, of, of ish, ish, issues. The question was raised, an is, the issue was raised that the papers don't provide much um, in explaining what is adaptation and what is reproduction. And there's, there's a simple reason for this. That was the case that we brought was focused on the failure of the, of the act. And the issue that the first amicus brings um, in, in this court was not raised in the high court. Had Professor Dean raised that issue in the high court, and he tells us that he was well aware of the the, the case and the call for the section six, the rule 16A notice that was published, had he taken advantage of that, raised the issue, um, the papers would, would have dealt with it. So the, the reason why it's not in the papers is because it was never an issue in the high court. On the issue of section 19D not going far enough and not making um, provisions, not, not um, capturing certain permissions that Marrakesh allows, we would be happy for any version of 19D that were to be read in to include such, such provisions. Um, we don't think that the failure of 19D to do that should preclude a reading in remedy. The, the final point, the, fi sorry, the final point I wish to, I've got two final points to make, I'm sorry. The first is, is the, the question of 24 months um, the issue of 24 months suddenly arose in the final judgment of the High Court. It was never an issue at any point. The original, the notice of motion in the High Court spoke to 12 months. The minister accepted 12 months um, on the basis of, as the basis for him not opposing. And we were quite surprised to see 12 suddenly become 24 in the final judgment. The draft order, which is part of our application for confirmation, um, the draft order that was put up uh, in front in the High Court um, referred only to, to 12 months. And then finally, if this court is of the view that, that the appropriate remedy is to read something in, starting with section 19D, but with certain variations, um, whether to bring strictly in alignment with, with, with Marrakesh or for any other reason, um, we submit that it would be appropriate in such circumstances for, for this court to issue directions to give the parties an opportunity to perhaps give each party to, and, and the amici to, to identify the manner in which 19D could be amended um, to give effect to whatever concerns the court, the court may have. Um, and we would gladly um, appreciate any such opportunity um, for making such submissions. Justice Midlanga, those are the only, the only points I wish to raise. Um, unless there are further questions, th those are our submissions in reply. Thank you, Mr. Berger, and uh, thank you to all counsel. Judgment is reserved. Today's proceedings have concluded. The host will now terminate the meeting.